God's house of prayer and his house in heaven. The northern kingdom of Samaria was inhabited by Gentiles, imported by the Assyrians, who had defeated the Israelites of the north before the Assyrians were defeated by the Babylonians. The Babylonians, who later defeated the southern kingdom of Judah and deported them to the lands of Assyria, Babylonia, eventually Persia, completed the total exile of the 13 tribes of Israel from the lands of Abraham. Uh, the North Kingdom was also called Israel, uh, of course Samaria, and Ephraim. Then the king of Assyria marched against the whole land. He came to Samaria and besieged it for three years. In the ninth year of Hoshi, the king of Assyria captured Samaria. He deported the Israelites to Assyria and settled them in Halak at the river Habor, at the river Gazan, and in the towns of Medea. That's 2 Kings, chapter 17, verses 5 and 6. The king of Assyria brought people from Babylon, Kuta, Abba, Hamak, and Sepharvan, and he settled them in the towns of Samaria in place of the Israelites. They took possession of Samaria and dwelt in its towns. That's 2 Kings 17, verse 24. They worshipped the Lord, but they also appointed from their own ranks priests of the shrines to officiate for them in the cult places. They worshipped the Lord while serving their own gods according to the practices of the nations from which they had been deported. To this day, they follow their former practices. They do not worship the Lord properly. They do not follow the laws and practices, the teaching and instruction that the Lord enjoined upon the descendants of Jacob, who was given the name Israel, with whom he made a covenant and whom he commanded, you shall worship no other gods. You shall not bow down to them, nor serve them, nor sacrifice to them. That's 2 Kings, chapter 17, verse 32 through 35. God said, As for the foreigners <coughs> who attach themselves to the Lord to minister to him and to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants, all who keep the Sabbath and do not profane it, and who hold fast to my covenant. I will bring them to my sacred mount and let them rejoice in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices shall be welcome on my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. That's Isaiah chapter 56, verses 6 through 7. In Judaism today, this would mean converting to Judaism, applied to foreigners, including Christian Israelis and Muslim Israelis. If they want to enter the third temple, they must hold fast to God's covenant with the Jewish people. They must follow the laws and practices the teaching and instruction that the Lord enjoined upon the descendants of Jacob, who was given the name Israel, with whom he made the covenant. A house of prayer for all peoples is a house of prayer for all Jewish people, who are people from the nations of the earth. God knew they would be defeated, deported, and dispersed throughout the world. This was a part of God's plan when he formed Israel. For the new heaven he was creating. He chose them and the land for them and had the Hebrew Bible in its entirety written at his command and direction through his anointed ones and his prophets. God 
is creating a new heaven of the spirits and souls of the Jewish people for the name of Israel to endure. Those who are righteous and in right standing with him will be placed in angelic bodies as a new host of the Lord of hosts, a host of angels representing the people of the world, the angels of Israel. And that's why it's a house of prayer for all peoples, all Jewish people. And you can't be worshiping false gods as those that have been imported in the northern kingdom. Eli Weasel said in regard to God in the Holocaust and the lost version of night. Quote, this time we will not stand as the accused in court before the divine judge. This time we are the judges. And he is the accused. We are ready. There are a huge number of documents in our indictment file. They are living documents that will shape the foundations of justice. Job was also ready to indict God. Job wanted God to explain to him why he, as a righteous man who followed the Lord's commandments, and so many bad things happening to him. I am sure that God is quite pleased with creation because he is perfect. And all things he creates are perfectly what he wanted for him. It is perfect for creating a heaven of angelic human spirit persons. A new heaven by the addition of a new host of angels, angels Israel. God decided to create a new host of angels, one where he does not create their personalities. as with the angels of heaven, but angelic persons who were formed as persons by their own ashes and self-will. Unlike angels, we are put through a battleground of choices with our own self-will that molds and shapes us as persons. Angels do not have self-will or a battleground of choices to make. Their persons are created and formed by God. God knew in the beginning that all men would suffer, the good and the bad. It is what makes our personality suitable for His purpose of creating a new host of angels. Quote, For behold, I am creating a new heaven and a new earth. The former things shall not be remembered. They shall never come to mind. Be glad then and rejoice forever in what I am creating. For I shall create Jerusalem as a joy and her people as a delight. And I will rejoice in Jerusalem and delight in her people. Never again shall be heard there the sounds of weeping and wailing. It's Isaiah chapter 65, verses 17 through 19. Quote, No more shall there be an infant or graybeard who does not live out his days. He who dies at a hundred years shall be reckoned a youth, and he who fails to reach a hundred shall be reckoned a curse. They shall build houses and dwell in them. They shall plant vineyards and enjoy their fruit. They shall not build for others to dwell in or plant for others to enjoy. For the days of my people shall be as long as the days of a tree. My chosen ones shall outlive the work of their hands. They shall not toil to no purpose. They shall not bear children for terror, but they shall be a people blessed by the Lord, and their offspring shall remain with them. That's Isaiah chapter 65, verses 20 to 23. And there's a reason I broke it up like that, because it could have all gone together. <coughs> In verses 17 through 19, God is speaking of a spiritual heaven that he calls Jerusalem. Verses 20 through 23 are what heaven was believed to be like for the people of the ancient age and the Middle Ages. God's scripture, scripture is written for errors gone by, and heirs to come. 
People of ancient times in the Middle Ages thought of the dead coming back to life and living long lives in a brutal, savage time of humanity. Planting vineyards and enjoying the fruit and not having it taken by others, dwelling in a home they had built, and not toiling for others was the heaven they thought of, not a spiritual heaven where you rise to God and live with Him. To them, God was always angry and the cause of their troubles. I mean, if you think about it, with no medicine, no science, no knowledge, no schooling, no universities, when you had lost your loved one, the spouse would walk out to the graveside and just go, I wish you could come up out of there and come back to me. That's, how, that's as far as they could think of it. They, they weren't thinking, what's he got into the hospital? What's he had eaten better foods? What's he hadn't drank so much? So they said, it was just, I wish he could come out of the ground and be with me. That's heaven to them. And today it's still prayed for by Orthodox as a fundamental principle of, of Judaism in the 13 principles of Rambam. Billions of people is what you're talking about appearing out of nowhere in the land of Israel. I don't know that you could sit on all in. For as the new heaven and the new earth which I shall make shall endure by my will, declares the Lord, so shall your seed in your name endure. Isaiah chapter 66 verse 22. God says he is creating a new heaven and a new earth. The new earth will be just as this is, earth is, when this earth is no more, when the final judgment of entry to heaven is made by the Creator who holds the souls of all men in his hand. The new heaven where the seed in the name of Israel shall endure. And God will rejoice in Jerusalem and delight in her people while the new earth is being formed. God calls the new heaven Jerusalem as a direct reference to heaven being for the Jewish people of the name Israel shall endure. Quote, I am sending an angel before you to guard you on the way and to bring you to the place that I have made ready. Pay heed to him and obey him. Do not defy him, for he will not pardon your offenses, since my name, Hashem, is in him. But if you obey him and do all that I say, I will be an enemy to your enemies and a foe to your foes. Genesis chapter 23, verses 20 22. In heaven, God is in you as my name is in the angel of his presence. That is what is meant when God says, before they pray, I will answer. While they are still speaking, I will respond. The information of our minds gathered by our eyes and ears is interpreted by our spirit and soul. Interpreted. It's not where your thoughts are. If that's true, there can be no heaven for any of us because our mind turns to dust. The spirit that God gives us, an element of the unseen realm of God, literally translates the little electrical signals and the chemicals and the, the, the tissue of the brain in different areas, different loads which is the person that we are, our spirit and soul. Our spirit can read the electrical impulses, chemicals, and different tissues of various parts of the mind. In heaven, our spirit and soul no longer has a mind filled with information to interpret. Spirit is very complicated element of the unseen realm of God. God will be the source of that information. In a sense, God becomes your mind. He provides the information for your spirit to interpret. God can be the information of your mind and the information for every angel and spirit of heaven at the same time. Jesus tells us that he will return in the time of lies and being. The life of the high priest. Oh, uh. I've been asked to, to tell you that uh, I have a lot more on this um, 
God providing the information of your mind in a video um, that is Messianic era versus day of the Lord. That's, there might be a little, few, few more words, but it's Messianic era versus day of the Lord. Uh, which is it? What's it going to be? Well, I don't think there's any question it's going to be day of the Lord. They don't go together. Jesus tells us that he will return in the times of lies and being. The life of the high priest who will see him return. The lives of the people of the towns of Caesarea Philippi been living. The generation of lies and being during his life. The lies of his disciples. And the lies of those who pierced him with the spear after he died on the cross. They're all dead now for 2,000 years. Jesus spoke five prophecies of his return with a specific time frame, lies in being, the measuring lines, and the prophecies all fail. The Apostle Paul said, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we, which are alive and remain, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. That, of course, is the rapture. And that just came from Paul. And that's in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 16 through 17 of the Holy Bible, King James Version. Jesus said he was coming back quickly. On the last page of the Holy Bible, in the book of Revelation, Jesus says, Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. This went over side to side. I don't know how much faith you want to put in there. Revelation chapter 22, verse 7. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. Revelation Chapter 22, verse 12. He which testified these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Revelation, chapter 22, verse 20. There's three more prophecies that did not come true. Of course, he's already gone at this time, but he still doesn't come back. And he's talking from heaven through an angel to a writer called John. He may... By all accounts, it's not John the disciple. Uh, although he tries to indicate it is him. Jesus has never returned. For almost 2,000 years, the dead in Christ and those alive during those years have waited to rise to heaven. His prophetic announcement did not happen. There are no Christians in heaven, according to Christianity. I don't think any of them even know that. <laughs> the time for a quick return has long passed. There is no reason or foundation to believe by faith or otherwise that he will ever return. Heaven is only for the Jewish people. If the Christians want to enter God's house of prayer on earth and his house in heaven, they will have to convert to Judaism. They will have to become Jews. Very observant Jews. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed that. The commentary of Rashi and myself on Isaiah 52, verses 13 through 15, and all of Isaiah 53, describing God's righteous servant, the Moshiach. According to my commentary, which includes commentary on the commentary of Rashi. Rashi's commentary is that the man being described is Israel, which means it's not the Moshiach of chapter 11. And which also means we have no description of him. 
52, 13. Behold, my servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted and lifted up. And he shall be very high. Rashi. This is Midrash form. He takes parts of verses and comments on the parts. And he'll, he doesn't necessarily take all the verse, but the parts he wants to comment on. And this is how he starts. Behold, my servant shall prosper. Behold, this is Rashi now. Behold, at the end of days, my servant Jacob, i.e., the righteous among him, shall prosper. And I'm using the JPS. Uh, this is from Shabbat.org. Those who they have the rendition that doesn't include the quotes between 13 and 15, and the quotes between verse 1 and 6 of uh, 53, the multiple quote verses. But this is from the JPS. Indeed, my servant shall prosper, be exalted, and raised to great heights. My commentary on that is, my servant is now the Gentile, and not the Gentiles, who becomes my righteous servant. In Isaiah 53, 11, after passing the test of devotion in Isaiah 53, 10. When he makes himself an offering for guilt in the covenant with God. From a sinful man whose life had been lowly, full of grievous events and serious injuries, a man of pain and suffering, familiar with disease, that the Spirit of God alights upon, to the crown of God's righteous servant who rises to great heights. This is uh, Isaiah chapter 11, verse 10. Chapter 11 begins with the Spirit of God that lights upon the twig of the shoot that grows from the stump of Jesse, where the ancestral tree of the kings of Judah has been cut down. That would be the line of Jesus in the book of Matthew. First thing you read in the New Testament. He can't be the man of chapter 11. Not, not just because that line was banished with Chaconia when Babylonia took over, uh, defeated the Jews, and destroyed the Second Temple, but because he doesn't come from the sun. That's why it's written that way. The stock of Jesse that has remained standing shall become a standard to peoples, nations shall seek his counsel, and his abode shall be honored. Again, Isaiah eleven ten. The abode of the righteous servant is humble when the Lord cuts him off from the land of the living, the world of material things in society. In Isaiah fifty three verse eight. And in the end the abode of the servant is one to be honored. In Isaiah chapter eleven verse ten. From a poor man to a rich man, with the many as his portion, and the multitude as his spoil, prosperous, and held in high regard by many, and a multitude of the Jewish people. Verse 14, as many wondered about you, how marred his appearance is from that of a man, and his features from that of people. Russian. That's, that's again from Shabbat.org and, and the commentary comes from, from them too. They have the commentary of Rashi on that. As many wondered, his answer, commentary, as many peoples wondered about them when they saw them in their humble state and said to one another, how marred is his Israel's it's in brackets, appearance from that of a man. See how their features are darker than those of other people? So, as we see with our eyes. It's Keith, verse 14. Just as the many were appalled at him, 
So long was his appearance, unlike that of man, his form beyond human symbols. Commentary. So marred was his appearance unlike that of man. Based on Isaiah 53 verse 10 and its primary purpose, this is the beginning of identifying the righteous servant as a man with disfigurement, blemished, with disease. He is not a man without defect, such as lambs, sin offerings, and rams, or guilt offerings. In the Torah, that would be Leviticus. If I were to be seen with all of my injuries from accidents and surgical operations at one time before he, together with my con congenital disfigurement, my right shoulder and arm is withered, my appearance and features would be marred from that of a man and people, unlike that of normal men. That's important because. If you can find a way to describe, to describe uh, this man that's so marred and his parents, I mean, it sounds like somebody you never want to look upon him. But in this verse, verse 15, it is said, So shall he cast down many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him, for what had not been told them they saw. And what they had not heard, they gazed. Russia. What had not been told them. His answer, commentary. Concerning any man, they saw in him. They gazed. So shall he cast down many nations. Uh, he just puts a Hebrew word in here. I, I don't know. They gazed. It says Hebrew, Hebrew letters. And then again, he says, they gaze. So shall he cast down many nations. Rashi. So now, even he, his hand, will become powerful. And he will cast down the horns of the nations who scattered him. That would be the Jewish people scattering the nations. Becoming powerful. Shall shut. They shall shut their mouths at a great bewilderment for, he says, honor. They're going to shut their mouths, all this, uh, see what they had never uh, been told and hear what they had never heard. Or honor. Keep. Just so he shall sorrow many nations, kings shall be silenced because of him, for they shall see what has not been told them shall behold what they never have heard. My answer to that, nations, the Gentiles, startled, and kings, leaders of nations, silence. By seeing God's righteous servant, God's servant David, Elijah, and the prophet like Moses as one man. And hearing that God's righteous servant arise in the time to come of Jeremiah 31 and the day of the Lord. That God's righteous servant is the only man to come who is described in the scripture and is inherently and implicitly the anointed one David, Elijah, the prophet like Moses, of whom there is no description for identification that the Jewish people throughout the world will be forgiven by God of all their inequities and sins by God's written word in the day of the Lord. That would be the new part of the new covenant, the new inclusion from Jeremiah 31. That heaven is being created for only the Jewish people. Christians will be surprised at that as well, Muslims. That God's righteous servant of Isaiah 53 is a Gentile, according to the scripture. That Jesus, being a Jew, cannot be God's righteous servant. That God's righteous servant is familiar with disease and crushed with disease, blemished, and could never be an offer for sacrifice. 
No man of Isaiah 53 can fit and offer sacrifice. That's why God blesses him. That's why God chooses to crush him with disease. To make sure that just doesn't happen. Because he knew what the Gentiles were going to do with Leviticus. Then the host of the Lord's host is a man in divine beings. The captain of the Lord's host is a Gentile host of the Lord's host and a harbinger of God's righteous servant. The God's righteous servant becomes a man in divine beings when God's spirit, who is the angel of his presence, and he is a person, the angel of the Lord, the Holy Spirit alights upon him in Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 through 2, that God would really redeem the Jewish people and in the same manner that he did in the Hebrew Bible with one man. At the time to come of Jeremiah 31 began when the state of Israel was created in 1948. The God's righteous servant fulfills and completes the remaining six or so prophecies of God in the day of the Lord. Okay. This is uh, Isaiah 53, verse 1, begins with quotes, and the quotes end after verse 6. The first speakers of Isaiah 53 are the witnesses of the righteous servant, in the quoted multiple verses 1 through 6, the many who are made righteous by God's righteous servant. That's what the story is about. Verse 1, who would have believed our report? And to whom was the arm of the Lord revealed? Rashi. Who would have believed our report? Rashi. Commentary. So will the nations say to one another, Were we to hear from others what we see, it would be unbelievable. I'm not certain what they see, but I think it's the Messianic era. This is never going to occur. So I don't know how you can base your opinions, and I know Jews for Judaism for sure does it. That's so much totally the same of outreach Judaism. If you're going to base a description on a man you're trying to find on an event that has not occurred, whether it will or will not, what about the man who's being described if that is the case? What have you done? What if you don't recognize him other than destruction comes to the land of Israel? And right now, that would be the destruction of 7 million Israeli Jews. If you have been told by a prophet, both of you two, Jews for Jews, outright Jews, if, if your organizations have been told by a prophet, God said he was going to raise up on us if we didn't do this and we didn't do that. And we know what happened. Syria, the field, the part of the North Kingdom, South Kingdom, Judah. The Babylonians defeated and deported, and then Rome destroyed and defeated all of them and dispersed the Jews throughout the world. Because why? Because the prophet wasn't listening to it. The arm of the Lord, this is still Rashi, like this, was greatness and glory. To whom was it revealed until now? He's not a lot of explanation there, I'm not sure. Keith, who can believe what we have heard? Upon whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? My commentary. The witnesses ask, who can believe that God redeems the Jewish people by the new covenant with sin forgiveness that is delivered by the messenger Elijah, who receives it from the angel of the covenant, Elijah being a man of heaven, of course, who is the angel of his presence, the Holy Spirit, that alights upon the anointing one. In Isaiah chapter 11, 1 through 2. By the covenant of friendship that comes with his servant David, when he, and it's God, sanctifies Israel by having the third temple built on his holy Mount Zion in Jerusalem. I have to see, lost track here a little bit. Oh, who can believe what we have heard? Okay, that's what all these buys.
by speaking to his prophet. Again, as he spoke to Moses face to face and friend to friend. And all by and with one man the Lord calls my righteous servant. Chapter 12 of the laws concerning King Moshiach of Ramah. That Moshiach will compel all of Israel to walk in the way of the Torah, perfect the entire world, motivating all the nations to serve God together. There will be neither famine nor war, neither envy nor competition. The entire world will be solely to know God. And the Jews will, therefore, be great sages and know the hidden matters with an understanding of their creator to the full extent of human potential. Yet God simply says, and this comes through the two covenants of friendship in the sentence uh, in Jeremiah 31, see a time is coming, Jerusalem is rebuilt. At the end of that it says, they shall never be defeated and dispersed again. Here's what those say for the day of the Lord the era of the Moshiach, or the times of the anointed one in an awesome, fearful day of the Lord. Yet God simply says he will send down the rain and its season. The trees of the field shall yield their fruit, and the land shall yield its produce. The Jewish people shall continue secure on their own soil, never be overthrown and uprooted again. They shall no longer be a spoil for the nations. He will establish for them a planting of renown. And again, these kind of go in hand with see that the time is coming, the desolate land will bloom again, as I paraphrase it, of Jeremiah 31. They shall no more be carried off by famine. They shall have to bear again. They shall not have to bear again the taunts of the nations. He will establish them and multiply them. He will place his sanctuary among them forever. His presence shall rest over them. And when his sanctuary abides among them forever, the nations will know that the Lord sanctifies Israel. Who would believe that one man fulfills and completes the remaining prophecies of God in the day of the Lord? The remaining prophecy to be fulfilled is the delivery of two specific covenants and the arrival of God's righteous servant who makes the many righteous, the anointed one, a shepherd, God calls my servant David, Elijah, who is taken to heaven in the times and recounsels the members of the Jewish families one to the other through Judaism, Judaism, and righteousness, and the prophet like Moses. He wrote the Torah at the command and direction of God. The witness is for the poor and who would believe them. That they had not been told by their wise men, sages, rabbis, theologians, that God's righteous servant of Isaiah 53 is a Gentile. In the beginning. Isaiah 63 says God comes from the dawn that is interpreted in Judaism to be Christianity and means he is coming from a Christian country. Uh, in addition, a dawn, uh, which is long since gone, is in the country of Jordan, east of the River Jordan. It's Gentile lands. He's coming from Gentile lands. And there are the people, the Jewish people, none are with him. He comes with the Gentiles. Remember the captain of the Lord's host. Joshua asked are you an Israelite or one of us? He says, no. I'm the captain of the Lord's host. Now I've come. And then we never see him again. It's just three short verses. What are they about? They're about a man and divine being being a host of the Lord's host. He comes with a Gentile. Well, Jesus was a Jewish man who came from Nazareth. Can you see God working in this? <laughs> it's really stable. Isaiah 53 can't be him, he's a Jew. And God comes to the Gentile. It's not like I mean, Cyrus of Persia was a Gentile. Elijah's a Gentile. He, he's, he's, he, he's a Tishbite. You can't find a clan of Tishbites in any of the tribes according to the genealogies provided and 
He is an inhabitant. He's not from. He lives in Ramont Gilead. Just to give you a frame of reference, he may as well have lived in a dump. It's a, it's a territory east of the River Jordan, north of Adam, and it's Arabs and Assyrians, and he lives there. The Jewish people did not come from Adam. They began the Promised Land, returned from Egypt in the Exodus, and were not allowed to pass through Adam. Huh. And returned from Europe after the Holocaust. Well, how's God coming anywhere if he doesn't have a land with him? How do we know anything about him if a man doesn't speak the words God tells him to speak? Did you think it was going to be a day of the Lord and he wasn't going to have a Moses? He's got a new covenant to deliver. It has to do with the first covenant. Well, who delivered it? Moses. It can't be the Jewish people. Okay, he's got to have a guy. One man. And he's got him described. He's a servant, he's righteous. So was King David, so was Elijah, and so was Moses. All servants, all righteous. One term, God's righteous servant. And I'm to believe from Rashi, Jews from Judaism, outreach Judaism, that today the Jews are the righteous servant. Good luck convincing me. The witness report that they had never heard that the captain of the Lord's host is a Gentile and a harbinger of God's righteous servant who becomes the host of the Lord's host. It's, it's easy to understand. A man of divine beings is not an angel. A man of divine beings is a man that the Spirit alights upon and like Ezekiel enters, God is in his spirit and then he speaks. We get this from Ezekiel. Chapter 11, Isaiah. Spirit of God and life upon him. God is in his spirit. He is now a man of divine beings. Any prophet that said God says in his books was a man of divine beings. You know, it's a task. It can be one task. It can be many tasks. One man just had to wrestle with Jeffrey. And God spoke. The divine beings, I know Judaism doesn't recognize the Holy Spirit for some unknown reason as a person. I don't know what could be more clear. It's just too many scriptural references. But that's a man of divine beings. Spirit lines on him. God's right there too. It's a man of divine beings, not an angel. The witness who never heard that the divine beings are the Holy Spirit who is the angel of his presence of Isaiah 63. An angel whose angelic body is not the form of a human with wings, but the very spirit of God. And God, the very angel who went before the Israelites in the Exodus, and God was in him. Quote, this is God. I'm sending an angel before you to guard you on the way and to bring you to the place that I have made ready. Pay heed to him and obey him. Do not defy him, for he will not pardon your offenses, since my name is Hashem. Since Hashem is in him. But if you obey him and do all that I say, that would be God, not me, I will be an enemy to your enemies and a foe to your foes. That's Exodus chapter 23, verses 20 22. The witnesses who have never heard that God created his spirit is in his spirit, and his spirit is the body of the angel of his presence and the angel of the Lord. How the angel of the Lord is in the burning bush and God speaks to Moses. How a man divine beings wrestled with Jacob and God spoke to Jacob, renaming him Israel. How the ground was holy where Joshua fell to the ground before a Gentile with drawn sword and asked, What does my Lord command his servant? The captain of the Lord's host answered Joshua, Remove your sandals from your feet, for the place where you stand is holy. And Joshua did so. Joshua chapter 5, 14 through 16. Those are the very words God spoke to Moses at the burning bush. The Lord is with the captain, and where the Lord is, so is the angel of his presence, the Holy Spirit, a man in divine beings. How Elijah the Tishbite, an inhabitant of Ramoth and Gilead, 
an Arab Assyrian town and land east of the river of Jordan is also a Gentile host of the Lord's host. Okay, this was a little involved and I'm really trying to press through. So I'll just uh, refer you to the book where this comes from. It's called Isaiah 53, The Day of the Lord. It's about 280 some odd pages. It has a long, almost 35 page summary of one paragraph of each chapter, which is uh, really helpful. But it's, it's a lot more than just Isaiah 53. <clears throat> and God dictated it to me, as he dictated the Torah to Moses. How Ezekiel is the host of the Lord's host, a man in divine names. This is uh, Ezekiel, 10 quotes. I'll give you the chapter and verse in a second. And he said to me, O mortal, stand on your feet that I may speak to you. As he spoke to me, a spirit entered into me and set me upon my feet. And I heard what was being spoken to me. To God, they show God saying those words, but see, you can't hear him until the spirit is in him. And God is in his spirit. He tells us the angel, obey him, because my name, I am in him. This is God speaking to Ezekiel, but Ezekiel does not hear God speaking until at the same moment the spirit enters him and sits him upon his feet. A spirit of God entering a man and God speaking means the angel of God's presence, who is spirit, alighted upon him and that God is in him. They could not believe how the Lord is symbolized in the story where he appeared and spoke to Abraham by the terebinths of Mamre as three men standing near him. The three men represent a host of the Lord's host. It's a man with divine beings. It's three persons. In my case, it's the person of Keith McCarty. It's the person of God. And it's the person of the Holy Spirit. All right here. And it's not new. This is all throughout the biblical, the, the Hebrew Bible. It just wasn't revealed to you. That's why nobody can believe it. When they... The final prophet of God said to be Muhammad of Islam. This is from Wikipedia. This, the information I'm about to give you on uh, the, the founder of Islam, Muhammad Mustafa, and then I had several comments to make on all of it. When Muhammad was 40 years old, he was commanded by God through his angel Gabriel to declare his oneness. And of course, God is one began with the Jewish people and the Hebrew Bible to the idolaters of the whole world and to deliver the message of peace to the embattled humanity. In response to this command from heaven, Muhammad launched the momentous program called Islam, which was to change the destiny of mankind forever. He was in Hira when one day the archangel Gabriel appeared before him and brought to him the tidings that God had chosen him to be his last messenger to this world and had imposed upon him the duty of leading mankind out of the welter of sin and ignorance into the light and guidance, truth, and knowledge to be a light to the world. It should sound familiar to the Jewish people. According to the accounts of this Shia Muhammad, well, I'm working on this. Again, I'm just getting started on all this. Uh, and I have a computer in front of me because my cell phone is not responding correctly this morning. And the Lord wants me to get this done. Um, 
Gabriel's not an angel. Clearly, they plagiarized the Hebrew Bible and put into the, their own cultural laws and norms and, and what they consider morality. And, uh, of course, Christianity is based around uh, a story. It's a story. They call it the greatest story you ever told. I agree. It's a great story. Billions of people have been deceived into believing it. Now, I can understand the people of antiquity believing it. But the people today believing it? Uh, I, I, I really don't know what to say about that. I, I don't know. I don't know how you can believe God made a human sacrifice to you and by his blood, by, by, by his stripes, we are healed. Again, God made me watch Christian channels. And, and then there's this one fellow, I'll sell you the, the blessings of David. I said, where, God, what are the blessings of David? I'm thinking. And he said, there are no blessings of David. He's making it up. People believe him. They send their names in with money, and he says their name on the air, and that's what they really want. So, but there is no angel Gabriel. He only appears in the book of Daniel. He only appears in the book of Daniel, uh, who is not a prophet, and it is not a book of the prophets. And he doesn't speak with God. That's what a prophet is. And even Jesus calls him a prophet and uh, quotes him as a prophet, and he's not. Um, it's just story. I mean, come on. A bunch, of, a bunch of men standing in a kiln that's burning hotter than the sun. It's just not gonna happen. <laughs> I get it. It's not gonna happen. But you read the same things, the, the, the leaders of Judaism read the same kind of absolute that can't happen, but because they like it and they say our sages believe that, we believe it. Well, your sages lived in another time. Michael Scobat, Jews for Judaism, who also claims Isaiah 53, is the Jewish people as one man, Israel, as one man. They had gathered, been crushed by disease, and offered themselves so guilty sometime in history that I'm unfamiliar with. Because he doesn't say it's something that's going to happen. They act as though it already happened. See, uh, tell me a thing about Reese Judaism believes it happened in World War II with the Holocaust. But that was just six million. That wasn't all the Jews of the world gathered as one man in Israel. They didn't get along like they didn't see the children. They didn't teach righteousness. Neither did Hitler. He's the one that offered them as these ram sacrifices because he reads an offering of oneself for guilt to literally mean, these are his words, it literally means a guilt offering. Let's go to Leviticus. Now, he doesn't say let's go to Leviticus. He says it's a guilt offering, but a guilt offering is an unblemished ram for theft or destruction of holy things, debts. What that has to do with anything, I don't know. Because he's, he's an anti-missionary, he's, he's pointing this interpretation of 53 away from Isaiah 53, but they, you know, they think they're forgiven of sin. They're not worried about that <laughs> and destruction of holy things. They're not worried about that. So I don't know what he's doing, except reaching, really, really reaching. I think the description of a man marred so, so, so much beyond human appearance, semblance, um, and, and all these, this, you know, play afflicted that the Holocaust just grabbed him, and he just made it fit. Well, that's what the Christians do. They make Jesus fit. They can, they can argue with me on every single version. If you've read, uh, watched my six videos on 53, 56 videos, some of them were just a half an hour. But um, there's a lot to it. And I'm the only person who's ever explained it this way. Is anybody who watches it that's familiar with 53 and uh, the commentators on it today, you realize nobody's read it like this. And nobody's ever connected the story of Ezekiel to it. And, you know, this atheist, pretty smart guy, but uh, 
You know, it's just like in Malachi 3. Every time God had me read it, I said, why is that angel leaving earth? <laughs> he wouldn't tell me. I didn't know until I typed it. I didn't get it. I didn't put these things together. I certainly didn't put Jeremiah into it. Uh, in this new code, I, I read the new code and it just, huh, it just went on. It didn't even mean anything to it. Because I had no background in anything. Except for the Ten Commandments and Charlton Heston. It's a great show. But there's been some better Ten Commandments since. I've seen them all. But anyway, Gabriel appears in, I think it's two chapters, and he's described as a man. A man. Gabriel, a man. And it's in a vision. It's not, it's not something where God says in heaven, I have angels, and it's the angel Gabriel and uh, Archangel so-and-so, the fallen angel, Lucifer. Um, you, you can't find that in the Hebrew Bible. And it came from Christianity. So so Islam, which didn't begin until the 700s, common there. I think that's the date here. Um, with Muhammad, long after Christianity, which would have been... No, before the Talmud was put together, Judaism, when it really became formal, was with the Talmud, I would suppose, and putting the entirety of the Hebrew, by all the scrolls together and canonizing. <clears throat> and um, it looks like they plagiarized both books. Both books. And like I said, put their own cultural laws, rules, morality, and philosophy into it, but taking the basis. There's, there's Abraham. He's in it. And now, I don't know if Muhammad is supposed to be a descendant of him or not. But here's what happened. So, he is, uh, he says he's the last messenger, the last prophet of God. That's what's on their mind. It's not the last messenger, it's the last prophet of God. According to the account of Shia Muslims, Muhammad Mustafa, far from being surprised or frightened by the appearance of Gabriel, welcomed him as if he had been expecting him. Gabriel brought the tidings that Allah had chosen him to be the last messenger to mankind and congratulated him on being selected to become the recipient of the greatest of all honors for a mortal in this world from Al-Islam, the birth of Islam and the proclamation by Muhammad of his mission. That's in Wikipedia. Muslims believe that the Quran was orally revealed by God to the final prophet, Muhammad, through the Archangel Gabriel, incrementally over a period of some 23 years, beginning in 609 Common Era, when Muhammad was 40 years old. That's an oral tradition. That's uh, Sumerian. It, it, that's what the time it is. It's the oral tradition written. So it wouldn't be so it wouldn't be forgotten. The year, uh, and then he died in 632 Common Era. Muslims regard the Quran as Muhammad's most important miracle. He worked miracles like Jesus did. You know, he could bring tidal waves with fish to feed the multitudes. And Jesus said five thousand with two loaves and five fish, or, five, or two fish and five loaves, something like that, to 5,000 people. And uh, a, a, a proof, his book, the Quran, a proof that he was a prophet, that God spoke to him through Gabriel, the angel. And, the, and that this was, the Quran was the culmination of a series of divine messages starting with those revealed in Adam, of Adam and Eve, and ending with Muhammad. According to tradition, several of Muhammad's companions served as scribes and recorded the revelations. Shortly after his death, the Quran was compiled by the companions who had written down or memorized parts of it. That's from Quran in Wikipedia.
God shows his last messenger. And Allah means God, by the way. It's just not the God of the Hebrew Bible and the God of the Jews. God shows the, uh, the last prophet, the last messenger, long before the time of Muhammad, when Malachi wrote Malachi. The messenger. Is Elijah for a time to come? And the time still had not come. The land did lay desolate. But they had not returned. It did not bloom again. Until 1948. And even then, it was a desolation. It took many years to get it going and uh, re renew all the old cities like Jaffa and Hafa and Tel Aviv. <clears throat> and, uh, of course, rebuild Jerusalem. You know, it's a metropolitan, metropolitan area now. Elijah, which, of course, is me. Now, how do you think Islam is going to react to me? We already know how the Christians are going to react. Not too favorable. Not too favorable. So this, you know, David is here because I'm David. David is here. I am the Moshe. I am anointed. Which means the man of Isaiah 53 is anointed. And the anointment is the alighting of God's spirit on me. That's how I know I'm the man of chapter 11, verses 1 and 2. Because there is no question that the spirit and God are within me. And that's how I know this whole concept of God is in his spirit. And I can point to scripture that says just that and explains things where it doesn't say it. Now they believe, they believe Muhammad to be a prophet because of his book. I've got two books that I dictated to me with all of this information. This is, this is chapter 49 of Isaiah 53 in the day of the Lord. See, it's not just about Isaiah 53. Now, the last chapter is the day of the Lord, and I'm going to do that probably on a separate video. I may make this uh, another two half-hour recordings on my camera will take. So, God's righteous servant, me. I am the final prophet, not Muhammad, and as the final prophet, and with the God of the Jews being the being the uh, Abraham uh, and Judaism, being the Abrahamic uh, religion that is correct. There's three. I mean, if you really sit back and think about it, who, who's going to win that? Who's going to win? There's three. Are the Christians going to win it with their human sacrifice? Are the Muslims going to win it? When, I, when clearly there's, it's just a plagiarization, it's going to be a light to the world. Peace and humanity. And they got there by stealing somebody else's book. They took the book of the children of God also. The Christians attached it. At least they didn't attach it to the Koran. You know, I mean, that's a plus in their favor, I suppose. I'm going to go ahead and start in the chapter 50. But they, I, I didn't know all that. I didn't know that they were using an angel that doesn't exist. And he doesn't. I've been in, to heaven and vision and told and no uncertain terms that there's no such angels. There's no Michael. There's no Lucifer. There's no fallen angel. It's just part of the story because that's what the people in antiquity and, and today too to an extent you just like to believe in that. The, the Christians got so much jumbled up in their minds. So much of the religion conflicts and doesn't make sense. And they've got entire armies of demonic forces that are at war with God. And this and that. I promise you. I know his power like the back of my hand. And uh, they, they, he, there's no contending with him. Whatever he thinks he is. He's willed it. Gone. You know. <laughs> He can take this world and turn it into a pea, the size of a pea, just by thinking it. He set off the big bang. That's how Genesis starts out. He divides uh, light from dark and this and that. Yeah. We're, we're the dark. That, and the division is the platform of heaven. 
And we're, we know we're in the dark because he had to put suns in there for us. So there, it's kind of a blend. You have to look. The first, the, the universe, his universe, the unseen realm, and then and then the real, the real, the universe of real, which is like, you know, sol uh, objects, solid things, stuff you can see, came with the Big Bang. And uh, it's all within his original unseen realm. So it, we're, we're a universe in a universe. It's not parallel universes, just one inside of another. Totally different from each other. Science totally different. We can never see the unseen realm except what he would place in our minds. I mean, he can place an angel Gabriel in my mind if he wanted to and have me believe it, and I would. But he doesn't. He's very real and matter of fact. Um, and, and, and the fact that this, at this time, people are still believing the things of the people of antiquity who didn't know anything. They didn't know anything, and they had, and they couldn't back. They couldn't go in there and say, "Well, I don't check that back. I don't know about that." <laughs> you know, they couldn't. There's no bookstores, no schools, no teachers. About all you could learn from the wise man was the Hebrew Bible for the Jews, and they spent their life in that book. Well, I had it. I read it for the story reading when I was fifty, and it's only because God was teaching me that that I had the knowledge that I do have. Um. It's just not possible that any man could do that. And I know I could. So anyway, the day of the Lord. Now this is interesting because I had kind of forgotten this entire chapter. The term day of the Lord appears in the books of Isaiah, Ezekiel, Zechariah, Amos, Obadiah, Zephaniah, and finally in the last book of the prophets, Malachi. In Ezekiel and Zechariah, the day of the Lord is said to be only against the nations, and then Obadiah against Edom and Esau, Christianity, and the nations. If you see Edom and Esau, it's Christianity. That's, that's just Judaism. If you're going to take their book, take all of it. Take the old tradition with it, Christians. One, they go together. The prophets warn that the day of the Lord is near, but it is not the end of the world. Now, this is true of the Essenes, too, the, uh, the sect of, uh, of Jews who wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls. But and, and with the same concept, evil's going to be gone, but the good stays. Uh, um, the destiny of the world will be, will be changed. God returns to the earth to dwell among his people in his sanctuary, which he's doing, on his holy mount Zion in Jerusalem, and the world will know that he sanctifies Israel. Lo, the day of the Lord is coming with pitiless fury and wrath to make the earth a desolation. To wipe out the sinners upon it. Isaiah 13 and 9. You say, well, see, that's not, you, you haven't been talking about that day of the Lord. Yes, I have. God's final word on it. Because that's not going to happen. That, 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 again, that's just fun to read. It scares people, man. Whoa, you know, war's coming, kind of a thing. For a day is near, a day of the Lord is near. It will be a day of cloud, an hour of invading nations. A sword shall pierce Egypt, and Nubia shall be seized with trembling. When men fall slain in Egypt, and her wealth is seized, and her foundations are overthrown, Nubia, Put, and Lud, these are, these are names for, the ter for territories that are pre-biblical for the most, they're pre-Abraham. The Hebrew. And all the mixed populations and cub and the inhabitants of the allied country shall fall by the sword with them. Ezekiel. Ezekiel has an account of all the tribes returning to the promised land and they go all go individually back to the lots of their ancestors. 
the reign of sinister. Do you know how many? It is impossible to determine that. Randam says, I can do it. I can tell you no, I can. He says, I do it by a spirit and there's no concept whatsoever that God is in his spirit. That the spirit that alights upon me is one of being able to determine your ancestry all the way back to the to the partitioning of the promised land and to the tribe you should belong to that you have the most blood of. Okay. Sounds great to make you I'm sure people will love it, but uh, not that I have not that I have done that. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah, that they, they is here, the peace in the world. I'm here. You, it's, a, it's just about undeniable. This is like a hundred times more proof than Moses said. You know, it, nobody even knew he was writing the first, the tour. Nobody, I'm sure nobody knew. And if they didn't know, they didn't care. And the fact that God was telling them, they may have believed, they may not have. Any of them would, would, would ask him, how do we know you're talking to God? Today, he'd say, well, read this. It's called Leviticus. You think I woke up and wrote God's laws without him telling me what to do? Because I thought that's what he was telling them? That's the Christian. I'm getting the word. I'm getting the word from the word for some reason. They call Jesus the Word before He came into body. <coughs> so they get a word from the Word. I, I, the Word, I think, means God. I'm not, I'm not sure. But everyone who invokes the name of the Lord shall escape, for there shall be a vineyard on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, as the Lord promised. Anyone who invokes the Lord will be among the survivors. That's from Job. For I have noted how many of your crimes and how countless your sins, you enemies of the righteous, you takers of bribes, you who subvert, subvert in the gate the cause of the needy. Assuredly, at such a time the prudent man keeps silent, for it is an evil time, seek good and not evil, that you may live, and that the Lord, the God of hosts, may truly be with you, as you think, hate evil. So here's some morality in a great story. Hey, the Lord. And love good. And establish justice in the gate. Again, the Essenes had gates. People like to hang out at them, as you can imagine. And tell stories. And what else are they going to do? If they had enough food and everything. And, be, and have all your friends clap you on the back. Great stuff. Great story. Look at all those Gentiles gathering around. Tell us Jesus story. Tell us Jesus story. They, they, they look at it. They, they get all giddy. And they'll put you some money. Yeah, it could have. Could be like that. And uh, I got a real long, I'm going to skip this one from Zechariah. But, but finishing up with Zephaniah on this uh, um, coming of the end of evil. And I will bring distress upon them, that they should walk like blind men, because they had been sinned against the Lord, and their blood should be poured out as dust, and their flesh as the dung. Okay, okay you know, let me read a little bit of this one. This is from Zachariah. Now, see, this is like watching a zombie movie. This is like watching a heart show. And we got, you know, most people love to see those every so often, especially as, uh, when you're young. As for those people that warred against Jerusalem, the Lord will smite them with this plague. Their flesh shall rot away while they stand on their feet. Their eyes shall rot in their sights. And their tongues shall rot away in their mouths. In that day, a great panic from the Lord shall fall upon them. And everyone shall snatch at the hand of another. And everyone raise his hand against everyone else. Jews shall join the fighting in Jerusalem. The same plague shall strike the horses, the mules, the camels, and the asses. The plague shall affect all the animals in those camps. And on and on. Malachi 3 brings a new concept to the day of the Lord. Why is that? 
because it's not going to be in antiquity in Jesus' time. It's not going to be in the Middle Ages. It's going to be in the age of the internet, knowledge, science, medicine, common sense, or as I right, reasoning, and in the lights in there. But it's still fun to read. This is the thing he was writing for antiquity because this is the kind of stuff they, they not only, they would believe these stories. And, and uh, today, we don't believe them. We just think, wow, that's fun to read. So God was writing it for different areas. He, he wrote for antiquity in the Middle Ages. And then we had the Age of Enlightenment kicking off in about 1600. Computers in 1960. Today, age of the internet. So, what what new concept in the day of the Lord does Malachi bring? It's God's final word on the day that He's preparing where the new covenant is delivered. And again, He knew they were going to be, be dispersed, and apparently, He had a pretty good idea when they would be coming back. Okay, this, it's the final word of God. Not only on the day of the Lord, but with the new covenant. What's he saying? What, what, what's really happening? Get away from all these fun stories. He's coming with a covenant of friendship. He says, you're going to be safe from now on. The nations of the world is going to know I sanctified the Jews. The Jews were correct about the Abrahamic religions. Going to build a temple which shows I have sanctified you. Because nobody's going to want you to build it. You know, uh, the Gentiles of the northern kingdom, imported by Assyria, didn't want the second temple built. They, they, they obstructed the building of it and tried to stop it completely with letters to Cyrus. <clears throat> or to whoever was leading Persia that, at the time they sent the letters. Um, and he says, uh, New Covenant, everybody's going to be sin free, holy seed, holy seed. And since he did the same thing, with the uh, exiles, he never says, I'm making you a holy seed to build the temple. He never does say that. But that is what happened. And it's going to happen again. He's going to have that temple built, I don't know, 10, 20 years from now. I, I don't know. Presumably before I die. But now David, he died before, before the building of the first temple. Although he had a lot to do with gathering all the materials for it and the wealth that went into it. And, and Solomon had a, had a home to the honor. There's always a lot of things happening again that are real. As a matter of fact, it took longer to build Solomon's house than the temple. So, he must have had a pretty honorable abode, right? <laughs> that and God talked to him. Um, now, God doesn't address the nations. As I started out, these different days of the Lord's in the various books, some are just pointing at Christianity, some is the nations. Uh, you know, they're kind of different. But Malachi 3 is real clear. It's the Jewish people, the people of the land of Israel, as much as anything. Um, that's the focus. When I come back, you know, the sanctuary to be placed amongst his people in Jerusalem. Although the covenant, uh, the French covenant does not say in Jerusalem. I think that's pretty much implied. Although, as David, see, David purchased the temple not for God after he had failed the test that God put him to as kind of a uh, making up for it. I, I, I've also been saying, and uh, I can go by. There's people who have raised millions of dollars to the building of the third temple out there right now. Just on the belief it will happen. God will come. They just don't know how because of the false teachings. Teaching of antiquity. The teaching teachings for people of antiquity. Well, the people today aren't of antiquity. Compared to those people, they are all brilliant geniuses. Every single person who has a computer is a brilliant genius. Knowledgeable. <laughs> Over these people. So... Here's God. Not only is he saying something different than your traditional day of the Lord, he's saying in future times, 
in the times where man is more enlightened, knowledgeable, we just going to build things where it is, and everybody's going to be safe because it, that that's just going to keep people from picking on you as much as they are, and they'll have it in their minds. Just don't mess with them. That God could be in there. <laughs> God might be there after all. Keep the keep the Middle East at bay, and of course, you know, when I die, that's not to say God's not going to continue on them as He did with Solomon, with uh, with Elijah, Elijah. Uh, that was followed up by Elisha. Uh, the Davidic dynasty was supposed to continue the line of David, but I don't believe there's anything that, well, his covenant does. Well, my son's a great guy, and I says, you really want, would you want me to put him through that, what you've been through? And I thought, of, <laughs> I said, yeah, that'd be good for him. <laughs> I mean, I really wouldn't wish, I wouldn't wish that pain on anybody, but it changes to so much for the good. And you know, you can't really feel another person's pain. I know that pain. I still live in it. You can't imagine what happened to me just two months ago. No, oh, I can't, I'm not allowed to tell you, and I wouldn't tell you. But um, it was brutal. I, I, it, it, went to, it went from... I had my top five things that he's done to me, and it moved up to, it, it went by everybody to number one. It made number one. I hope that's the culmination of those events. So anyway, lasted about three months. So back to, the, uh, back to this. So it doesn't address the, the nation, but only Israel and its people, which is all Jews of the world. Everybody in the world is forgiven. Doesn't mean you go to heaven, got to be in my sin. Um, and hopefully this is going to be, you know, there's, all the Jews aren't coming back to, to the promise and to Israel. But I think my presence, and particularly he built the temple, and then consider this. The nation, if you think the Christians are friendly to you today, you're not going to be saying that two or three years from now. Not when you can put in their face. We told you we were right. Because that's what they're always telling you. You, you know, you know, you know, read your own Bible. That's Jesus. That's 53 Jesus. And you've got all the arguments that I'm putting before you. By the way, this Isaiah 53 in the day of the Lord, every single one of the 50 chapters is summarized in a paragraph, a few of them, two paragraphs, as an addendum. If nothing else, you stop that, it's like six pages. I don't know how many pages, it might be more than that. Um, <laughs> okay, it might be a lot more than that. But anyway, um, yeah, if you're in a bookstore, just flip to the back, read the addendum, and just see all the different things that are addressed that, that really aren't Isaiah 53. The first 20 chapters, are kind of like you need to have this knowledge. You need to know about angels and God in his angel. And uh, a lot of I've kind of broached, but to moving on. God says, of course, you've heard this, Behold, I'm sending my messengers to clear the way before me to build the temple. And the Lord whom you see shall come to his temple suddenly. The messenger is Elijah in verse 23. As for the angel of the covenant that you design, he's already coming. I've talked about that. The angel of his presence brings the new covenant, Jeremiah 31. All Jews are forgiven of their sins and iniquities. And it's going to be when I get my books published. That's when it becomes official from God's mind. And even then, it has to be people who, who find out about it. Once you find out, whether you believe it or not, but when you start hearing your sin free, that's when... You need to avoid the evil inclination and really, really stress your Judaism and learning your Torah, which is the effect God expects Torah on your hearts. And he, God, revering his name his name. Because you don't want to miss what he's preparing. <laughs> you don't want to miss it. You don't want to miss watching the evolution of the Jewish people from Abraham. He's going to pick, you know, God's name will probably be, you know, Poindexter or something. Who knows? He's, he's so funny. But uh, I'm sure, okay, it'd be serious, God says. 
He said, we could, I may keep cut up a lot, and he's a human being, it's, it's good for him, and I, I play along some. But he'll tell you, it's, it's, not, it's not nearly enough, or, or it's too long, it's not long enough. God recognizes that the forgiveness and the equities and sins of Jewish people will not cause all to hate him. And in Malachi, he says it, I know there are those that don't. Those that do, I'm putting in a scroll of remembrance. In Christianity, believing in Jesus and accepting him as his one Lord and Savior brings sin forgiveness and entry to heaven when he returns. You know, I've covered that. Even if you've committed murder and other crimes against humanity and God, and that's just not true uh, with the God of Israel. He's not going to have bad people up there. But it doesn't mean you don't want to practice Judaism. Because I know the Jewish people would like to focus on life today. The, the, the heaven that the Christians dream of and think of uh, is not first and foremost for the Jew. It's being a light. It's living life as well as it can with all these instructions God gave us on how to do it. And so this is this is bonus time, and God knew that. You just have to understand, he's able to play these things out in his mind as though he sees the world, the evolution of generations and cities being built and things being invented and knowledge and universities coming in, and he can just watch it all happen, and he can see what's going to happen to the Jews. He knows they're going to get destroyed in Europe. And he'll tell you, Okay, I'm not supposed to go into that. <clears throat> Maybe someday. But um, but moving forward here. I just keep that in mind. He knows it's going to be a modern time. And here I am. And listen to what he's having me tell the rabbis. And you know what you, you know what the effect of that is? You know, it's not a metaphor like tour on your heart. But, you know, he says, he forgives sin, that makes everybody learn Torah. You know, it's really two separate different things. But, uh, so anyway, God knew in modern times that secularism and reliance on science, medicine, and technology that his righteous servant might not be recognized. The utter destruction is simply on its way, just like it was with the Assyrians, Babylonians, and the Romans long ago. There's no mention in Malachi 3 of the destruction of the nations as it is in, in some of the uh, the books and chapters and verses that I was that I just read at the beginning of this video, uh, or at least on the day of the Lord. It, it is implied there will be in this destruction in the land of Israel. Because God says, if he doesn't do it, when I come, it will be with utter destruction, as though there's going to be some, and there would be, to take the temple now. Did it have to be something like the Six Day War? I don't think I don't think Israel would ever just storm it and say, "Well, that's it. We're just tired of it. Just try to go." And unless there's some heinous act done, like a like a nuclear suitcase bomb, where they finally say, "That's it. Only Jews in this land, and we don't care what it takes. That's what they did to us. They just threw us out, took everything we own, took our bank accounts, took our houses, took everything. Just said, go." We had to walk to the promised land. But it's the building of the third temple. Now, oh, but, I, I don't know. Right now. <clears throat> it's the building of the third temple. That's, that, that's what's so important. Deceiving the enemies of the nations that come against Israel and the sanctification of Israel is a land and people blessed by God with his presence 
in his sanctuary is how utter destruction is avoided in the awesome, fearful day of the Lord. So it's the exact opposite. He's not coming to destroy evil. He's coming to safeguard the Jewish people so we don't see a holocaust again. He's, basically, that's what he's telling you. If the land were destroyed today by nuclear bombs from Iran, 10,000 missiles launched at the same time from Lebanon, and they'll care, you know, the sling of David, the protective system to bring down rockets is never going to be able to stop that. And you got 7 million Jews there. And we lost 6 million in the Holocaust. Yeah, that's such a brutal thing, a brutal time. I still have a hard time understanding how we've already advanced so far, as awful as things are even today, from that. Well, people could, you know, the Nazis, they, they, they singled out children. That was their favorite kill. It, 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 <laughs> they were running low on bullets. Instead of shooting the kid or gas and gassing them, they throw them in those kilns alive. So, you know, that's just, a, 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 but, and it's a people. It's not some madman. It's not, it's not Dahmer. It's, you know, it's not, it's not just one crazy person out there. It was an entire country. And, and they didn't want just there. Russia was doing the same thing. They were hauling them out of their houses, making them dig ditches, and just going down, fanning them, father, son, kids, or kids first, then throw them in there. Whole blocks, whole neighborhoods. No, I don't want to. some of the visions he's given me I, to make me really feel and understand. What, what, what would it be like for the Gestapo just to just break down your door and you're sitting with your family at dinner and you have no clue what, who they even are? And all of a sudden, everybody's being murdered. And, 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 and your girl's raped first. And your wife. I mean, and he put me into it. It's, you know, we can think about it and be horrified. But he can make it so real, it's as though you're there, but it's still different once you come out of the vision. It's a lot different. One, you're not scarred by it. <laughs> but, uh, I have a lot, a lot of things on this. That's just about it for the day of the Lord that I have. You know, this, this man and divine being, host of the Lord's host, you know, it's one God. It's, it's the oneness of God. Uh, of Israel, one angel, and that's the angel of his presence, who doesn't have an angelic body, and he's in and one man, the Moshiach, the anointed one, and the anointment is the spirit of lighting and entering it. That's the anointment. There's, there's no oil as in our world of, of the, I call it the real, and God's uh, world, the unseen realm, which is the universe inside the universe, and he's responsible for this one. You know, uh, he made a division of a heavenly bright white light you can't even see in it. That he he, he kind of shows me in visions uh, when we're uh, we're dealing with David in the temple. It's not the same temple that's that's on the ground here. It's different. But still, the temple still got the walls around. There's a lot of similarities, but. Uh, in one vast room, it's that bright white light, and in the other is the king's throne and water coming out, flowing down the steps out front. And uh, so here he is in a future time. See, the time is coming in the future. In the year, it isn't the end of the year 2020 or, or anything like that, but, but again, he knew. He knew exactly what was going to do. He needed to come to me in 1957 or select me when when the first satellite was launched into the air by Russia, Sputnik. And he said that's when he touched my arm and deceived me. He really won't. You know, you say, well, how, how can you not not trust him or not believe him or this or that? Because I'm in the final assignment. Lying to me is just part of it. And he finds it so humorous <laughs> to make me think I'm coming out of this thing. And I thought it, I thought it 11 years ago, I thought we were done with all the pain and shenanigans and, <laughs> and adventures with, uh, with, with Christianity. So Christianity knows you're here.
I said, who's here? You, you, you're the man Jesus claimed to be. Isn't that funny? Jesus, Jesus says in the New Testament to, to his people, to his twelve at least, do not listen to those who come in my name. It's kind of funny because when he comes, he says, I'm Jesus, I'm not supposed to listen to it. But the fact is, he came in my name. He came as the teacher of righteousness. He came as the man of Isaiah 53. He came in my name, and that's given me all kinds of trouble to get this thing going, to do what I have to do for God, to keep utter destruction from Israel, and to save the Jewish people. I've got these Christians who believe in human sacrifice. I've got these rabbis who believe a man of a hundred years is suddenly going to be thought a child in every single human being, every Chinese, every Korean, every Eskimo, every one of them, suddenly are going to go, huh, the Jews have been right all along. We need to exalt them. Let's take our stuff and give it to them and till their land for them. And, and look, there's no pain anymore. Huh, it's like I died. And this is the idea of uh, heaven on earth. Just for the antique what he believed in, in <laughs> a resurrection. So I got to deal with that. They, aren't they supposed to be protectors of the Jewish people? Follow God's laws. Have better lives. Morality. Look at, they, you don't just go hurt people. You don't, you don't keep people from doing what they need to get done with lies and false teachings. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I fell into the rabbis again. I call it a lie when you say the Jewish people gathered as one were, were stricken and plagued with disease as one and as one offered themselves for guilt to God, passing a test of devotion, and that they then went out and had long lives, all saw their children, and they made the rest of the world righteous. Well, let's see you do it, Israel. Yeah. Huh? Hey, rabbis. Sylvia Singer, Michael Scoban, all you people who preach Israel as the man, the Jewish people, described in Isaiah 53, I want to see you, since you want me to go build a temple as David, you want me to bring peace between the nations and throughout the earth, you want me to end pain in the individual, you want me to teach billions of Chinese how to speak Hebrew, that's what you want me to do. I want to see you make the world righteous. I'm the righteous servant, and I dedicate it, and I pass it to you. Now you like that. I'm not going to let you stop me, and guess what? I got somebody behind me that you don't want to contest or contend with. Because people throughout this land are going to hear this very speech about you and Jews for Judaism and Outreach Judaism, your 900-page book, which I shudder to even think about opening personally because of your mid-rationalized layer 53, which you had posted on your Facebook notes, and I was one of your friends, and you said in it, share this with everybody. You gave me... You gave me the right to use it as long as I don't slander you, perjure you, and guess what? God had me tied in Isaiah 53 in the day of the Lord, which will become a bestseller someday. A big part of your midrash on the human sacrifice of the bluish rams by Hitler which shows that Isaiah 53 describes the Jewish people. Six million of them. Well, that's all I have on that day of the Lord and uh, doing my job of bringing the wrath and bringing the reckoning. I'm the righteous servant of David. I'm Elijah, the prophet like Moses. And soon to be published, a song, a new song God had me write. And I'm an eternal priest of the order of Metelsevich and King David, and a rightful king that would be leader. It's the same song David used. It's scripture. When David wrote it, God told him, David, write this down, a psalm of David. My Lord said to his Lord, 
And there we go again with Christians. They say that if it's the Lord and he's talking to the Lord, that's God of the Trinity talking to Jesus. What's the problem? One, one of them's capitalized and one's not. What was the other thing? Big, big reason? Well, just read it. It's a song about him. It's written by somebody who works for King David, a, a servant of uh, uh, something in the kingdom. He's writing of him when you read it. Because he would be Lord to this man. He's a lowly servant. Yes, Lord. You know, he's a king. That's what you say. It's not Jesus. It's not meant to be Jesus. It's not a, what do they call it? Kiss me of Jesus? I don't know what it is. God wrote stories that have meaning that's, that's just not right there until you know the story of Jesus. I got to end with this since I apparently still got a little camera time. So, nothing is ever written about Jesus. Okay, nothing in this issue, nothing by them, uh, no commotion at the gate, at the gate with Jesus saying that, you know, you can't say you're a righteous servant because our founders are righteous servant. And uh, there yeah, are no altercations noted in the New Testament. And it would have been, God tells me, a pretty contentious group out there. Not a lot of law abiders. But uh, I said, I know I have to deal with them. I think I stuck on ship side to deal with them. So, until, until 70, what happened in 70, the first big Jewish revolt, 500,000 Jews defeated, battle after battle. People don't think the Jews fight. They fought for every inch of Jerusalem they could get. And then there was another revolt, and then another revolt. And they finally, <laughs> it's like being in God's fire, we're fine. They were in the Roman fire, we're fine. They said, okay. That's it. Let's get out of here. Thanks for the land, God. We gotta go. You made everybody mad at us. We're saying we're the chosen. Well, well. So, this one, the first book, uh, you know, so you see these two rabbis, you know, trudging along through Syria and heading towards Europe. And, what are we gonna do for money? What are you going to do? I've got kids and everything. I can't go to Sunday to make money. That's, that's, that's how I make my living. It's teaching the Hebrew Bible. His friend says, his says it's from a, that story about the Jesus. It, I get money every time I tell that story, especially if I change it up a little bit. Every time I tell that story, boom. You know, I got lunch. I got dinner. I sometimes have food, but then, I, then that's that. They love it. <laughs> they just get all. I believe, baby, Jesus, all on the ground. Holy rollers. That's where the first holy rollers came from. You don't know what that is, look at it. Said, you got it. They love this stuff. And slow mo looks at it and said, oh, you got to be kidding me. You can't put that story in the Hebrew Bible. You can't connect Moshe to that. He comes in right there to Jerusalem and defeats Rome. And becomes king of the world. What are you talking about? We'll just change it. <laughs> Maybe it was the writers who were just people. They were people going there because there was no Jesus. Nothing written about him. Are you kidding me? Man, walking on water, feeling, feeding everybody. The blind see, the crippled walk, dead or risen. You think he'd have been. He'd have probably taken, uh, he'd have taken the uh, the Roman leader's position in front of him. That's what he would have done and just made him leave. He'd use his head instead of trying to fight him hand-to-hand uh, -hand combat. I guarantee you, the revolts would have had more success, although ultimately beaten down just by numbers. If God and me had been there with, with this unit, <laughs> this human body or any other human body. Just because he knows everything. He said, <laughs> it'd be more like the American fighting the British hiding in trees and bushes and stuff. <laughs> so anyway, uh, thank you. Uh, tell anybody who's interested in Isaiah 53 that there's a, a new take on it. There's a new explanation. And uh, tell Mr. Leper Scholar that's from the 
the town, Babylon town. And there's a, actually, it's quoted something, Sanhedrin 9b. I'm not sure if that's in the town or it just gets spoken of in the town. I know the Sanhedrin, I know what they are. Um, but I don't recall seeing anything that in the town of Sanhedrin is like a, a special book or something or some extra or a section. I, I don't recall ever seeing that. And, and again, this is where, you know, God, uh, you know, I'm still human. I'm still Keith. And the way he does that is I still, you know, I still can't find a car key <laughs> if I have a car. <laughs> and, you know, I'm, I'm the same old forgetful person. He keeps me forgetful. But I'm still a lot better than I was. Um, anyway, it was easier using my computer, but um, I don't know what it looks like on the video with me looking down so much. It's so much today I was reading and not uh, being able to, uh, being, like Isaiah 53, it's on the tip of my tongue anytime. But um, I hadn't looked at these two in a couple of years. A day of the Lord. The term day of the Lord appears in the books of Isaiah, Ezekiel, Zechariah, Zechariah, Amos, Abadiah, Zephaniah, and finally in the last book of the prophets, Malachi. In Ezekiel and Zechariah, the day of the Lord is said to be only against the nations, and then Obadiah against Adam and Esau, Christianity, and the nations. Basically, they're saying the Gentiles in general, uh, and in particular, the Christians. Those who told you to get down and walked all over you, those who took your book and called it their own. Those who told you that God had let you and came to them because you were such sinners. But isn't it funny? The only reason they don't consider themselves great sinners is because of a human sacrifice. God gave to them so he wouldn't see them as sinners, but he saw his people as sinners and left them. It makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. The prophets warn that the day of the Lord is near. But it is not the end of the world. The wicked and sinners will be punished and justice established. These are some excerpts from those books. Lo, the day of the Lord is coming with pitiless fury and wrath to make the earth a desolation, to wipe out the sinners upon it. Isaiah Chapter 13, verse 9. For a day is near. A day of the Lord is near. It will be a day of cloud, an hour of invading nations. A sword shall pierce Egypt, and Nubia shall be seized with trembling. When men fall slain in Egypt, and her wealth is seized, and her foundations are overthrown. Nubia, put in blood, and all the mixed populations and cub, and the inhabitants of the allied country shall fall by the sword with them. Ezekiel, chapter 30, verses 3 through 5. Yet even now, says the Lord, come back to me with all your hearts, and with fasting, weeping, and lamenting. Rend your hearts rather than your garments, and turn back to the Lord your God. For he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in kindness, and renouncing punishment. This is Joel chapter 2, <laughs> verses 12 through 13. But everyone who invokes the name of the Lord shall escape. For there shall be a remnant on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, as the Lord promised. Anyone who invokes the Lord will be among the survivors. That's Joel also, chapter 3, verse 5. 
For I have noted how many are your crimes and how countless your sins. You enemies of the righteous, you takers of bribes, you who subvert in the gate the cause of the needy. Assuredly, at such a time, the prudent man keeps silent. For it is an evil time. Seek good and not evil, that you may live, and that the Lord, the God of hosts, may truly be with you as you think. Hate evil, love good, and establish justice in the gate. Perhaps the Lord, the God of hosts, will be gracious to the remnant of judgment. That's Amos chapter 5, verses 12 through 15. Thus said my Lord God concerning Adam, Christianity. I will make you least among the nations. You shall be most despised. Your arrogant heart has seduced you, you who dwell in cliffs of the rock, in your lofty abode. You think in your heart, who can pull me down to earth? Should you nest as high as the eagle, should your eye be lodged among the stars, even from there I will pull you down, declares the Lord. Oh, and I. Chapter 1, verse 1. And I will be bring distress upon them, that they shall walk like blind men, because they have sinned against the Lord. And their blood shall be poured out as dust, and their flesh as the dung. Zephaniah, <clears throat> Zephaniah, I'm not sure how to say it. Zephaniah, thank you. Chapter 1, verse 14 through 18. As for those peoples that warred against Jerusalem, the Lord will smite them with this plague. Their flesh shall rot away while they stand on their feet. Their eyes shall rot away in their sockets, and their tongues shall rot away in their mouth. It says that. It goes on quite a ways. As Zechariah, Zechariah, chapter 14, verses 12 through 17. Just on the side, and this because we were cutting up and being funny, myself in the spirit of the Holy God, who is a person. We couldn't put these videos on if it hadn't been for the coronavirus. It was my stimulus check, the, pan, uh, the, the relief check uh, because of the virus and the need for everybody and stimulate the economy. That's how I got this camera and a little light. And this big TV behind me. And his spirit asked God, where he asked him, I said, you didn't have anything to do with this plague, did you? I said, oh, you can get this stuff? He said, of course not. Don't be looking at each other and said, we wouldn't put it past you. Any event, we left for an hour over there. Malachi 3 brings a new concept to the day of the Lord. It is God's final word on the day that he is preparing, where a scroll of remembrance will be written at his behest concerning those who revere the Lord and sing his name. That would include he, the Lord. He does not address the nations, but only Israel and its people. It is written for the return of the Roman dispersal. And why do we say that? It's because of the new covenant. See, a time is coming. That is for the day of the Lord. Because one of the seed of times is coming is Jerusalem is rebuilt, and then it ends with, and you shall never be deceived and overthrown again. Yet Malachi 3, in the, where God makes this declaration of the day of the Lord, when he returns, which is messenger, who clears the way for him, and the new covenant, the new covenant arrives with the angel of his presence. There's no other way to to uh, comment on that. that. That's who the angel of the covenant that you desire is. It's not the friendship covenant, it's the only other covenant out right there. And I will bring distress upon them, that they shall walk like blind men. 
because they have sinned against the Lord, and their blood should be poured out as dust, and their flesh as the dung, as I just read from Zephaniah. Okay, this is destroying sinners in the day of the Lord. And then this. Yet even now, says the Lord, turn back to me with all your hearts and with fasting, weeping and lamenting. Rend your hearts rather than your garments. And turn back to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in kindness, and renouncing punishment. That's from Joel chapter 2. Well, these are examples of writing for the people of antiquity. In the dark ages, that is prophecy, but has nothing to do with the day of the Lord and God's final words on the subject for a time to come, as announced in Jeremiah 31 of the New Covenant. In the day of the Lord, he comes with his messenger and the angel of the New Covenant of sin forgiveness, not to destroy sinners or require their repentance, which I hear all the time. He'll come when we get all the juices of sinning and to be observant to the degree that we as human beings are capable. That would be from Jews for Judaism. And see, they rely, their interpretation of Isaiah 53 is the people Israel, the Jewish people as Israel, is based on the Messianic era occurring. You throw that out, and he's got nothing to back up that Israel fits all 12 verses. It's all based on that. It's all based on the nations and their leaders, the kings, saying, oh, we've been wrong about the Jew all the time. Exalting them, holding them up high. Okay. Not to destroy sinners will require their repentance, but to forgive them and give them another chance. He also amends the first covenant to be mindful of the teaching of my servant Moses, whom I charged at or with laws and rules for all of Israel, rather than strict compliance. And this is how Malachi starts again. Behold, I am sending my messenger to clear the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek shall come to his temple suddenly. As for the angel of the covenant that you desire, he is already coming. Malachi chapter 3 verse 1. And keep that in mind. Because Jesus Christ uses that verse that I just read. Malachi 3 and 1. To describe John the Baptist, his cousin, as Elijah. But there's some interesting twists to it. The angel of his presence brings the new covenant of Jeremiah 31. God knew in modern times of secularism and reliance on science, medicine, technology, that his righteous servant might not be recognized, believed, or heeded. The other destruction of, I think it's, it's verse 24, I think, maybe 23 and 24, is simply on its way of chapter 3, Malachi. Just like it was with the Assyrians, Babylonians, and Romans long ago. Today, that would be Islam. God is his creation. And it's, he, he's not going to personally come down and destroy it as he did Sodom and Gomorrah. It's just, it's just another way of saying I'm going to raise up armies. You know, that were already there. But the Jewish people didn't heed his prophets, and they were destroyed. Taking all these verses of Malachi 3 together, including God returning to his temple, which must be rebuilt, with his messenger clearing the way before him, 
a new covenant where God forgives the iniquities of the Jewish people and remembers their sins no more, which I have said is just an amendment of the first covenant, the preparing of a scroll of remembrance for those that revere and esteem his name and heed him and enter into heaven, and being mindful of his teachings and laws as observant Jews rather than strict compliance. The concept of the day of the Lord by all previous prophets is changed. The utter destruction prophesied, save for a surviving remnant, is alleviated. There is no mention of the destruction of the nations. It is implied that there will be destruction in the land of Israel, though not necessarily utter destruction. It's the way he phrases it. If you don't do this when I come, it is with utter destruction. Well, does that mean when he comes, there's going to be destruction? But it's only utter if his prophet is not successful? Elijah, in this case, who is, has the same purpose as the righteous servant. To build the third temple, there will be war in the Middle East causing destruction in Israel and the loss of life among the Jewish people, but it is the building of the third temple that prevents the utter destruction by the nations against Israel. And this goes hand in hand with when you rebuild Jerusalem, see the time is coming, I'm coming back. I have the covenant of friendship with Messiah, my servant David the shepherd. I'm going to place my sanctuary amongst you. And you shall never be defeated this first again. He has to come back. I mean, that, he said, when you get Jerusalem rebuilt, I'll come back. I, you know, clearly he realizes the temple's not here today. And he knew it in the times of Jeremiah. He knows it has to be rebuilt. He knows he's going to have to be part of that. And to do that, he has to have a Moses. A somebody who can say, this is what we do next. And he's got to have generals listen to him. And he's got to have, he's got to have the Knesset listen to him. In all probability, in my opinion, he won't tell me again. He doesn't tell me anything of the future. I have to figure it out for myself. Things that are natural to, to ascertain, uh, we'll talk about. But uh, I think it would be something like the Six-Day War. I don't think Israel will initiate taking that now under almost any circumstances short of uh, a plot by Islam, including the Palestinians, to bring in a, a nuclear suitcase or two. Something like that may, may spark things without being attacked by Egypt and Jordan and Lebanon and everybody all at the same time, Iran and their back test Bible. <clears throat> Defeating the enemies of the nations that come against Israel and the sanctifi sanctification of the land and the people blessed by God with his presence in his sanctuary is how utter destruction is avoided in the awesome, fearful day of the Lord. A day that is not one day, but will begin when he comes to prepare his righteous servant who is to be his virtual representation and spokesperson to at least, and to at least, his return to his temple. A day that establishes and makes certain that the Jewish people will never be defeated and uprooted again. The Lord's way is clear that only if his righteous servant, who is Elijah, the shepherd David, the prophet like Moses, and of course the righteous servant. One description, four men. He can handle it all. But the way's not going to be clear if the verses are being shunned, despised. Thought to be afflicted by God, by the Jewish people, we're not going to get there. But I believe that changes based on the later verses. 
Observe it and set for your life. Accept it as the shepherd David, a leader, to tend the flock and be a ruler among them. Now this is a king with a king. The day of the Lord is the last prophecy of God. And that day, all remaining prophecy of God in the Hebrew Bible is fulfilled. The sending of the prophet like Moses, the descendant of King David and Elijah, with the delivery of the new covenant and the covenant of friendship, all fulfilled in one man. Through one man. The man God calls my righteous servant. One God of Israel, one angel of his presence, and one man, his righteous servant, a man in divine beings. A host of the Lord's host, who is God's virtual representation his spokesperson, and a man he has absolute and total control of from his mind, emotions, and body to his every act and his every word. And I am that man. And it's not something you say lightly, I can promise you. That you're listening to a man in the nine days that they are here right now. Speaking to me as I read these things, having me skip when they want me to skip through mine. <laughs> I said, you got to give me some of those. Come on. And he said, we'll give you some of those. I see him change, change words that I'm saying. Uh, back, back to this uh, Malachi 3, 1 and John the Baptist as Elijah. First and foremost, historically it cannot be him. Because when he comes, when he comes, that one would be when Jerusalem is rebuilt, because he's in now our God first. And, and that, of course, is the verse Jesus uses. Okay, but let's just say, let's go back to his time. Number one, the temple was there. I don't know what he was clearing the way for. And uh, God would have been coming with a covenant of friendship to place his sanctuary there. I don't know why he put that in a covenant. But the most important part is it says when Jerusalem is rebuilt, which of course is already there, but when it's rebuilt, the Jewish people will never be defeated and dispersed again. Well, 40 years after the death of Jesus in 70 common era, the Jewish people had their first of three great revolts against Rome. They were decimated. Over 50,000 lost by some accounts. And eventually, this uh, defeated this first one wrong with the temple being burned to the ground uh, during the first revolt. There were two more revolts actually after that. Um, and Elijah, of course, he, he died long before Jesus did, had his hair cut off, put it on a platter. Uh, and his people came to Jesus, 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 John, your cousin. Well, he didn't say your cousin, John the Baptist. He wants to know, are you who you say you are? As in, I'm in trouble. I need your help. And Jesus' answer is, go tell him the blind see, the crippled walk. He can go to heaven. He said, go tell him that. Quite the character. Dude, it just gets better. Why is he saying John the Baptist is Elijah? You think he doesn't know about the book, the scroll of Jeremiah? Never be defeated again. This is the man who said all the prophets said of him, he'll ride an ass into Jerusalem and be executed. But the only prophet who even talks about it is Zechariah chapter 9, verses 9 and 10, verse 9. The Messiah shall ride an ass in Jerusalem, verse 10, and defeat them and call on all the nations to surrender, become king of all, which I suppose would be the Middle East. Well, he's just changed. He just flat out lied. Yeah. <laughs> he let his cousin get head chopped off. Lazarus had to lay dead for an extra day because he was late. Kidding, man. I don't know. But here's the problem. We, I don't have it in front of me. Yeah, the guy's kind of surprised me with this, but I know it well. Malachi 
3, verse 1. The end of it is, and the angel of the covenant that you desire is already on the way. Guess what Jesus left out? There's no mention of the angel of the covenant that you desire. It's intentionally left out. It is a deception of no small means. He left it out. And why? He can't put it in. Well, Jesus, what's the covenant? Uh, simply is written <laughs> of all the Jewish people. He can't put it in, so he left it out. But he had it, he had to, but he had, at calling himself the Lord, he had to have someone clearing the way from him, and he couldn't get around that part of Malachi 3. God says, I'm coming. And I'm sending my messenger before me, to clear the way before me. It doesn't say to build the temple. But God says, and then I shall return to my temple so, suddenly. So I believe that's the best way to uh, interpret that. This left it out. Well, anyway, uh, I think that's a good elaboration on the Lord, uh, the day of the Lord. You know, those those early books before Malachi, they put the people of antiquity. It's to scare them to stop sinning. It's just a scam. You know, God's not going to come down here and kill every sinner. He obliterate the planet. And um, in Malachi, he's coming with sin forgiveness. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm making a school of remembrance. You'll find out this sort of heaven that I'm building just for you, creating just for you, my nearest people. I mean, it's so far removed from the concept of a day of the Lord. Um, that you just kind of perk up is because why? It's see a time is coming. It's a prophetic day of the Lord, so to speak. It's not one that is imminent. It's around the corner. It's there will be a time when I come back. When I come back, sin forgiveness. I'm telling you, you only have to be mindful of my laws and my strict compliance. It's the same covenant. It's not. It's new only because it's an amendment. He includes plenty, plenty of confirmation that. I am your God, the Jewish people are, uh, are his people. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed it. The Lepersala versus Israel in Isaiah 53, a guilt offering. What is his, the Messiah's name? The rabbi said his name is the leper scholar, as it is written. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him a leper, smitten of God and afflicted. And that's from the Sanhedrin 98, small case B. The belief that Isaiah 53 describes the Jewish people as the man Israel that is often attributed to Rashi is now the prevalent teaching on the subject. Rabbi Singer of Outreach Judaism, Judaism is one of the most followed on the internet in his analysis of Isaiah 53 being Israel. His analysis is very similar to Christians in that he believes the animal atonement and worship laws of the Torah are to be applied to a man, to men actually, and women and children of the Holocaust. The Christians call Jesus the unblemished Lamb of God. Rabbi Singer says the Jewish people who were murdered and slaughtered in the Holocaust were ram guilt offerings for the purpose which might prosper of having the Jewish people return to the promised land. That would be God's purpose that might prosper in chapter 53. Rabbi Singer's commentary from his Midrash, Isaiah 53, Jesus or Israel, on Isaiah 53, 10. This was posted on a Facebook page. The end of it says, share this with all your friends. In other words, anybody can use it. 
So, yeah. And everybody should know that, by the way. You can't just use something that's on somebody's side. Uh, but if you're giving the uh, authorization to the it's Seagate, it's okay, but you still can't perjure or slander them. I'm a lawyer. I don't practice, but I am a lawyer, and I know these things. So, I'm just going to really deal with 5310. I'm not going to put his whole, go through his whole address or anything. I'm only, it's the one verse that you can't just uh, prove by physical evidence. He offered himself for guilt. You know, all you can do is say somebody's worth what they should do. Except there is a little bit more. In any event, I am going to read, this is in quotes, there's no... I, I didn't do anything. I, I didn't even make corrections for this bad grammar. <laughs> it's exactly as it is in his address on Isaiah 53 that he had posted on Facebook in his notes many years ago. I was a friend of his at the time. So I'm sharing it. I'm sharing his 5310, but I'm going to give my commentary on it. Contrasting it with his commentary and the problems I see with that, which is not an unusual thing the Jews have always done, but in particular in the, in, in the times of the Talmud, Rashi, uh, Rambam, they were always writing about each other and what that person thought and this and that. So these, I'm going to read everything because it's in quotes and I don't want to, someone say I'm misquoting something because I'm not. So he starts out, and he quotes himself, 53.10. Hashem desired to oppress him, and he afflicted him, if his soul would acknowledge guilt. He would see offspring and live long days, and the desire of Hashem would succeed in his hand. Then he quotes 53.10 from the Jewish Publication Society. He doesn't say where the first one came from. I don't, I, I recognize it, but I don't know where it came from either. But the Lord chose to crush him by disease. That, if he made himself an offering for guilt, he might see offspring and have long life. And that through him, the Lord's purpose might prosper. This translation by the Jewish Publ Publication Society uh, of the Hebrew uh, into English, began in, I believe it's 1956, from scratch. They didn't use, they didn't use old texts from the Talmud era. Uh, you know, the, the Old Testament of the Christians is, a, is from a Greek translation, and then into English, and translations are tough enough as it is without going through two instead of just directly one, and the, and the, the, the rabbis and uh, scholars on language uh, who were involved with that process for many, many years um, began with the uh, Lindbergh Codex, the oldest Hebrew translation of the Hebrew, uh, not translation, the oldest uh, Hebrew Bible um, <laughs> written in Hebrew. Uh, it's a, and and they, they translated it. It's, it's one that's been used for, for hundreds of years. So then uh, after giving these two verses of 5310 from different sources, here's what he has to say. Not only are we stuck with the same God punishment, God situation here as we were before, this one is even more per perplexing. Yeshua was supposed to be the sinless, unblemished lamb that died for your sins on the cross, and yet it states right here that if he would have acknowledged his guilt, he would see offspring and live long days. The JPS, Jewish Publication Society, rendering gives a little different twist to an already sticky situation. It says, Parentheses, if this were referring to Yeshua, close parent, 
that the Lord chose to crush him by disease. I don't know if you can classify a cross as a disease or not, but I don't think hanging and being crushed are the same thing either. In fact, according to John's Gospel, not a single bone of Yeshua's body was broken. Of course, this was stated so he could be equated with the Passover lamb, and John is the only one that compares Yeshua to the Passover lamb. But how could this be speaking about eternal Israel? Very easily. The offering of guilt in this verse is actually, literally translated as guilt offering. The significance between the guilt offering and the Holocaust is so astounding, even as grotesque of a thought as it is, I could not overlook it. A guilt offering is defined in Leviticus chapter 7 and goes something like this. The guilt offering is a fire offering in which all the parts are to go up in smoke and the high belongs to the one making the offering. I mentioned before that during the Holocaust, Hitler not only burned Jews in the ovens of Auschwitz, but he also used their skins as lampshades and their hair as stuffing for pillows. He sacrificed these peoples on the altars of ovens and kept their hides as his portion. But not until he worked and starved them to death. So, after the atrocities of World War II, the Lord's purpose had prospered. Because the land that was sworn to us is once again being inhabited by its rightful owners and is awaiting the final engathering. The guilt offering, uh, that's it, that's it for the quotes. That's his commentary on verse 10. The guilt offering is a sacrifice made for unintentional transgressions. It was the sin distinct from the biblical sin offering. The transgressor furnished an unblemished ram for sacrifice at the temple in Jerusalem as well as in cases of sins against holy idols, theft, commission of fraud, or false oaths, with monetary compensation to the victims for their loss, plus a markup of 20% of the value to cover the priest's earnings. This is guilt offering. An offering for guilt, translated by the JPS, says he offered, God chose to crush him with disease so that he would offer himself for guilt. That's the literal translation. The literal translated is he offered himself for guilt. Doesn't say anything about the guilt offering. Does it say he became a guilt offering? And God took his life. Doesn't say anything like that. The Jewish people murdered in the Holocaust had not made any unintentional transgressions against Hitler and did not make monetary compensation to Hitler if they did. It is the people Israel that makes themselves an offering for guilt in Rabbi Singer analysis, though he seems to be saying Hitler made a guilt offering to God of blemished lambs. And these aren't the un this, this isn't the unblemished lamb of God, the unblemished rams of God for guilt offering sacrifices. These were all just regular people. Everybody has some sins in their life. So they, they technically, you know, if this is what happened, I really can't figure out what he's done here. But I'm, I do my best. I try to keep an open mind. But you, you, you can't offer an animal in any of the offerings that's blemished, defective, sick, diseased. You can't offer them. God won't accept them. And, and human beings are not a part of an animal sacrificial and atonement 
system, system of learning, learning with sin is, learning it can cost you, you might have to give up your prize to animal if you want to be forgiven by God, and it teaches you how to cook your food, it's a system he did away with through his prophets, Isaiah chapter 1, Amos, Psalms, he, he told, he told the Jewish people, not only did he said, do not sacrifice your children, which they were doing to the fire God all too often, <clears throat> but he told them, I no longer want your animals. Stop sinning is what it all boils down to. And this is even picked up in the book of Hebrews of the Christians. Basically, Jesus said, God no longer wants bulls and goats for sin. He has prepared my body sacrifice for sins. The final sacrifice. His body prepared by God. I don't believe that any more than I believe God would accept a blemished lamb of God. Because, and I've, I've already shown the video, you cannot dispute it. It's, it's written in the scripture with how he manipulated and lied and changed verses. He's a liar and a deceiver. He's a false prophet. He prophesied five times of his return and he never did it. And he even said it's going to be quick, it's going to be quickly, it's going to be quickly. That's well, been over 2,000 years. But basically, it was his generation. When he was born, everybody alive at that moment is his generation. When they're all dead, his generation's over. They're all dead. He said, I preach, you shall see me in your time. Sounds kind of vengeful, kind of like the movies you see with the fellow getting ready to be electrocuted and tells the one I'm coming back, harsh you. You, the people of Caesarea, there are those amongst you who will see me in return. You never did. You, members of my twelve, there are those amongst you who will be alive when I return. You never did. My favorite, Book of Revelation. The great story of destruction of all things and Jesus comes and the Jews that don't believe in him are not only killed, they're put in hell. Judaism doesn't even believe in the hell. If they don't believe in Jesus, well, why would you believe a liar, a deceiver, in a book of lies and deceit? People who believe in human sacrifice, being healed by the blood of the death of another. Do they not want to be responsible for their own actions as it is? It's a sick, sick religion. And if you knew God as I knew God, you would know how repulsed he is at the thought that he would offer a human sacrifice to anyone, much less the Gentiles. He doesn't give any... You, you sacrifice to the gods the man is dead to receive favor. What favor did the Gentiles give God with their presence in heaven? The continued sinning? I've been told Jesus won't just forgive your sins if you accept him. He's going to forgive all the sins you make the rest of your life. Because he already knows you're going to do it. So he's forgiven it. I walked out thinking to myself, I got carte blanche, I can go do anything, I accept this Jesus. And, but no, I don't accept Jesus. Indeed, I don't think he ever existed to think he's a story. And I had good reasons for that. But let's get back to God murdering his children. I don't think Hitler offered them. So here's these friends, somebody had to offer them, so God's going to offer them. Not unlike he offered his son. He, uh, there, there's no explaining, and I haven't even finished yet. So, Hitler sacrificed these people on the altars of ovens, these, these ovens to get rid of bodies of fire that become altars, and kept their hides as its portion. It's very interesting, because in verse 11 of Isaiah 53, the righteous servant who makes the many righteous receives as his portion the many and as his spoil 
the multitude. The reference is to the people he's making righteous, the many. Many will be made righteous. A righteous servant takes the many righteous. Your portion, the many. You can keep your followers. <laughs> Maybe they'll donate to your uh, your cause, giving God's temple a little bit. But I gotta I gotta wade through rabbis like this. And Jews for Judaism and Michael Sobach who basically just ignores ten. It's so simple. If you're gonna use Israel as the man to be identified in Isaiah 53, who's supposed to be God's representative, like Moses in the day of the Lord, but if you're gonna use them, you're gonna have to use them as God used them with Moses. You gather every single one of them. They have to agree to a man. I want to know when all Jews got together as one and were plagued by God with disease and brought to grief with sickness, that they would offer themselves for guilt, said God. Be given all life. And make the many righteous. How many people did the murdered Jews of the Holocaust make righteous? How many of them saw their children after that? None of it makes sense. And Hitler's portion, is it him? Did he make the offer? Why is he getting a portion? Is Hitler the righteous servant of God? That's what he's saying. It's, it's my Bible. And, and yet he's got thousands and thousands and thousands of Jewish people believing this. And I'm that man. I'm God's representative. I am his Moses. And this is what I got away to. Those people that follow tell you, they'll throw you out of a group so fast, they're even suggesting, hey, it, it could be Elijah for the same purpose. They both have to make people righteous, bring them back to Judaism, and they both have a have a task which might prosper. God's purpose in Isaiah 53 is not stated. We don't know it until Malachi 3, which is which is uh, where God announces the day of the Lord. And he says, I'm sending my messenger, who is Elijah. And I'm going to return to my temple suddenly. That's, that's his purpose. Okay, so picking back up. Rabbi Sanger seems to be saying that Hitler is the man of Isaiah 53 who makes an offer of Israel, the Jewish people, which again would have to be all of them if you're going to call them Israel, as a Leviticus land guilt offering. And he and Hitler receives as his portion the house. Isaiah 53 12 says God's righteous servant which is Israel, and we're, and we're using the sixth name of the Holocaust as Israel, as best I can tell, because the the rest of the Jews, another sixth name, didn't offer that sixth name enough, and that's not what he says. He's saying God did it, because God's purpose was, I want y'all back in the promised land. So he murdered and created the Holocaust. I guess he raised Hitler up for that purpose. And I don't think so. I don't understand thinking like that either. I don't get it one bit, but that's me. I couldn't believe it when I read this. I really couldn't. And I'm going to offer myself a guilt. The guilt that the Jewish people feel from not being righteous, which is why they're sick and suffering in the opening verses, who are the witnesses. It's not kings, as everybody seems to think from chapter 52. There's a reason they're in quotes. But... And then God says, well, you got to be suitable for my purpose. And the purpose is, I want you to go make these sinners, these people who are sick, emotionally sick, from being unrighteous, by being my righteous son. That makes them any righteous. But you got to be made ready. And I have a process you're not going to believe. It's like getting a cadet ready to be a Marine or a Navy SEAL, except multiply that by about 10 million. It's in his power, and with me, he came to me in the womb to make certain that I lived a life of suffering, filled with disease and injuries and 
or just many other things. It's in the book. He came. He went to the womb. He, he came to the womb of Jeremiah to make sure Jeremiah was a priestly, godly man. <laughs> I was the exact opposite, an atheist for 50 years. And I had a serious spirit just like Moses and just like Ezekiel. So, verse 12 of, of uh, chapter 53 of Isaiah says, God's righteous servant is exposed to death. He is exposed to death by disease, from an affliction by God. God chose to crush him with disease. Then he says, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reward him because he was exposed to death. It's a disease. It's a sickness that can kill you. With me, it was cancer. There's other diseases that can kill you. Skin cancer, colon cancer, lung cancer, untreatable lung cancer. And here is my proof that I offered myself for guilt. I said early on, there's no physical proof. But there's some indirect proof. I was told I had no more than a month or so to live to be prepared to die based on pictures of my lungs, each lung. Dr. said, you see those? This is after colon cancer and chemotherapy for colon cancer. That should have killed me. And he says, you see all those white spots all over your lung? He says, every one of them is cancer. It's growing cancer. It's too advanced to even take. You should have come in earlier on the colon cancer. So everybody get checked if you think you might have a problem or when they say you should go get checked. And um, he said, this this spread quite a while back. I don't know why they hadn't only picked it up. They didn't pick it up until after the colon chemo. And I haven't seen a doctor since that day. Just walked out of there and turned it down. You know, quit work. Just walking every day. Uh, you know, I get stunned. I, it's just hard to say. In many ways, I, I guess I was in denial. They said that's part of it. I guess I didn't even think I was really going to die. And, uh, you know, for the most part. And that was when the planes hit New York. That's 20 years ago. When I was 50, about seven to eight years after that, with the doctors, it's when God first spoke to me. And again, I'd been an atheist for 50 years. I knew nothing. And one of the first things we did that week, he said, let's go to the bookstore. You need to buy a Tanakh. My response was, what's a Tanakh? <laughs> I didn't know anything. I had kept away from all these people. And basically, he was with me. He made sure I did it. He orchestrated many things in my life. He t early on, he took me on visions uh, one, two, three a week as part of the teaching and just starting out the preparation process before the pain started getting really bad, uh, which has been up every year since. This is year 13 since he spoke to me. But uh, as you can see, he was starting to make a little headway. Um, five years teaching me, five years writing blogs with the, are the chapters of my book, Isaiah 53 in the Day of the Lord, which is dictated to me by God just as the life of the righteous servant of Isaiah 53. That's my life. And he dictated it. God is my ghostwriter. Um, they're very interesting. And that's how I know all these things that all the great rabbis and the rabbis today didn't know about. That's my proof. Look at the proofs that Moses gave to the Israelites so they would believe that God had really sent him to have them released and brought back to the promised land. It's in the Torah. Moses says, who am I? I do the same thing. Picking back up with this, I'm getting there to the end of it. So, exposure to death, that's not, that's not dying. The righteous of Israel does not die from the sickness they are given. Now, I don't know in the Holocaust when they were plagued with diseases, if everybody had to be plagued before they were gassed and shot. I think the answer is no. I mean, and, and then to go out and teach this, this no more longer fits Isaiah 53 than a man of the moon that struck God. 
because this is God's representative in the day of the Lord, and it is so easy to find. Jeremiah, see a time is coming, the land blooms it again. See a time after it's after desolations. Go look at, at, at uh, Isaiah 61. He talks about, he's not talking about the exiles, he's talking about the Russian dispersal in that chapter, the ruined cities and everything being restored. That's today. The temple era exiles that returned didn't do anything with the northern kingdom. It was inhabited by Gentiles. They didn't restore Israel. And I don't know, other than the temple, that they restored Jerusalem. But it's been restored today. See, your time is coming. I'll make a new covenant with you. So there it is, you have it. And the land blooms again, which simply put means the Jews have come back, and they're going to come back. He's just waiting. I don't think he killed six million people, murdering them the most horrendous atrocity I've ever thought of. To make them come back, that's not him at all. God's like, he's like that old crusty dad that just says, uh, you know, I made all of this for you, this big branch. I did it all. I struggled and I've always dreamed of you taking it all over and continuing our name. And he looks up and his son and he's in a dapper suit with a suitcase and says, go into the city. <laughs> and he repeats what he just, what I just said. And the son says, no, I, I don't really want it. No, I mean, it's a nice place, nice land. I know you like me to tend it for you and take care of it and, and exalt his name in doing so, making it beautiful, building him a house, a new house if he needs one. But no, I'm going to go to the city now. Now, I realize he's not getting pushed out by the, by the Romans, but, you know, 2,000 years went by plus with no one really coming back to the story. And that's how the scripture read it, and that's how he writes it. I know all the practicalities, Zionism and everything else, but the fact is, they, have, they did return in 48, created Israel, and blooms again, Jerusalem's rebuilt, uh, Jeremiah 31, two times to come have been fulfilled. Okay, we have a new covenant. There's only two covenants unfulfilled in the Hebrew Bible. The covenant of friendship that God grants when David, Mashiach, is here in Malachi 3. The day of the Lord. Not, uh, the chapter of the day of the Lord. And it's a changed day of the Lord from all the different references in five or seven other books of a day of terror and destruction of horrendous plagues where evil is eliminated from the human race, but the good stuff. Okay, well that's never going to happen. That's not God's, that's just fun stories for antiquity and even today. I mean, it's, you know, we, <laughs> I watch zombie movies sometimes. <laughs> Talking about the resurrection of the dead, but I don't believe the dead are resurrected. I have too much knowledge, science and medicine, and just plain common sense. That's not happening. The Orthodox pray for the resurrection weekly because of Ram Bam. You got 13 fundamental principles of Judaism. The 13th is belief. You have to have belief in the resurrection. But where are you going to put the million Israelites in the Exodus? Where are you going to put all their ancestors who were in Egypt for 400 years? People who didn't even cook the food. Because God had to teach them with the animal sacrificial and atonement law. Bring your animal to a fire. Now, share in it. At least the priest teach it. Teach it. It's better eating if you're going to not drink the blood. Okay? Part of the law's rules and commandments. You've got to cook it. You can drain it all you want. You need to cook it. And that's what that was about. And he did away with it. And even Jesus did that. God no longer wants animals for sin. He's prepared a human body for it. <laughs> that was never intended for a human body and God knew, knew what the Gentiles were going to do. They were going to come up with their unblemished land so they could get sin free. And that's why Isaiah 53 describes a man as blemished and with defect by some of the words if you look up their definitions of the synonyms Serious injuries, just, just an entire life of misery. I 
in the man of Isaiah 63. And that's every verse. My midrash will show you that and show you how all these things that I'm talking about, of course, are in the book. Um, I am the exact opposite of Jesus Christ. I am the blemished, deceived prophet of God. I'm not a lamb. I'm a man. I can't be used for the human sacrifice system if anybody's thinking about it. Because I'm the righteous servant of God. They think, oh, that'd be a good sacrifice. That'd be good. What I want to see, now that we all know the Jews are the righteous servant of God, all of them. There's seven million in Israel, seven million in America, and I don't know how many millions in Europe and across the world. I just say 14 million. When are they going to make the world righteous? They say they're the righteous servant. When have they made the many righteous and a multitude as one man is it? it it's so far from thinking. It's just as far as Jesus Christ said it. They have taken this concept, him and Jews for Judaism, Michael Sobach and his cohorts have taken this concept and this idea and they can't back it up one bit and yet they have convinced because of their unique personalities, very very jovial, very nice to listen to, very intelligent, but with false teachings and thousands of Jewish people believe this. It's Israel. You, I can't even mention it could be Elijah, much less a Gentile. But that is exactly what God did so he could have his vengeance and vindication of his Christianity by saying, you know what? My Isaiah 53 describes a Gentile. I come from Adam. I wasn't allowed to go to Adam with Moses. I come from Adam in a time of best Christianity. A sow and a dom. I'm coming from Christianity, and he says in, in chapter 63, and of the peoples, it's his people, the Jewish people, none are with him. It comes with a Gentile. And it's for his vindication against the Christians because he knew what they were going to do, and Jesus is a Jew. He can't fit it. He's not, he's a, he's not from the stump of Jesse. He's from the cell of ancestral tree. He can't be the man of chapter 11, the anointed, Mashiach, who is described in 53. He can't be him for so many reasons. His lies and deceits. There may be other rabbis who've seen these things, like Zacharias the riding the ass into Jerusalem, and he says, I'm going to be crucified there by the Gentiles. When you look it up, and he says, all the prophets like this of me. Well, there's 20 prophets in the Jewish Bible, and not one of them says it. What one does say is, the Messiah will ride it, uh, ass into Jerusalem, which basically means he's going to be a humble man that doesn't have to be created by me. God's making sure... Moses ended up being the most humble man on earth, and I know why. It's because of how God treats you. But I got too much of David that I have to show in the purposes that I have. My, my spirit is still furious, but the good thing is, I don't feel the fury inside. He can have me talk like this, like I'm furious, and I'm fine. This stuff, this stuff, I won't even hardly remember saying any of this. It's, a, it's incredible. The stories I could tell people once this gets going, just sitting around there, you know, for those who truly really believe. Uh, and, and the evidence is overwhelming. Uh, to not believe it is it's really to tell me you'd have never believed Moses. It's, you, you, you and your ancestors would have died in Egypt. You wouldn't have gone, you'd have stayed. You can't use animal sacrifice for human beings. It, it's just mind-boggling. Absolutely mind-boggling. Okay, let me see where I'm at. I think I'm about done. You know, when Toby Singer says, in his commentary on Chen. And I had this in quotes, so I pulled it out from that. 
He says that this phrase, that if he made himself an offering for guilt, is interpreted by Rabbi Singer to be, quote, actually, literally translated as guilt offering. Now, he is very well known for interpreting the Bible of his own without using anybody else's translations. And his people listen to him all the time to see what the translations should be and how maybe the Christian Bible got things wrong, or even the Hebrew Bible. I don't think we've ever seen that. <laughs> but in particular, a lot of these people are uh, Christians who have converted to Judaism, or they are Jews who were Christians just by how they were raised, and then, uh, I guess, Messianic Jews too sometimes. But they look to him for translations, and look what the words he uses. Talk about the sect of actually, literally translated as guilt offering. The JPS, a panel of men who worked their lives at interpretation of translations, they didn't come up with that. Rabbi Islam, Orthodox, Conservative, Reform, and then linguistic uh, experts from universities, well seen, well pedigreed, and they don't say it's actually literally a guilt offering, and that's what God's saying, so let's use his animal sacrificial system. And in Toby's case, let's, let's offer up six million Jews. You see, none of that works, and Hitler does, none of it works. So what he's really saying is, God just murdered six million Jews to scare them all back to the promised land. That's all he's really saying. Does anybody think God did that? I don't. I don't. I don't even think, when he says he put a plague against them in antiquity, that he really did it. I think the plague was just there, no different than the pandemic we're under. Well, much different, but that's just the way times were when he didn't have medicine, people didn't cook their food, and this and that, he would tell you. He said that he took, I took credit for him to, to scare him, I had to scare these people to death. You know, that's how it goes up to Moses. Moses, you go talk to him and come tell us what he said. We're all going to die. You know, you feared God. But not today. Even Judaism is starting to get into the Christian thing of God wants a personal relationship with you. Well, you better go back to the mountain if you think that's true. That's not who he is. You're starting to associate him as a human being. That you want a relationship, that doesn't mean he does. That doesn't mean he doesn't want to, to do the things he says he's going to do for his creation. He's got a different perspective. He's not human. He is an entity, a being, in existence that does have emotions, but he's got absolute knowledge and absolute power. He thinks it, puts it in a vision, he wills it to be. There is a process which goes by with his elements of the unseen, primarily, primarily his power. You know, we have all this water on there, and Moses' his name was pulled from water, this and that. Do you know that there's tiny microscopic particles of water, H2O, in outer space? He drew it with his power from the far corners of the universe to his planet. He decides everything, and that's just the way it is. And he doesn't care for the fact that the rabbis have decided to stay in antiquity in the, in the dark ages. And anything those people came up with which fit their world, but can't possibly fit our world, they need to change. He expected more of them. They dismissed. This is the record. I'm bringing it for him. But he orchestrates every single word from my mouth. Bottom line, bottom line, this is it. Let me finish up with this. Who receives the long line? I want to know who receives the long line. Because it's not Hitler and it's not the Dickens of the Holocaust. Who receives the long line? No one. Would God accept an animal sacrifice of blemished humans from the Gentile Hitler? 
No, he wouldn't. He wouldn't accept you in sacrifice, period. Where the much less ram sacrifices for guilt. For being guilty of, of destroying stuff, stealing stuff, theft, this and that. Uh, it's not the guilt we're talking about. That's verb and adverb or verb and noun. This is the emotion guilt. They said they were sick. Okay, the man's called the righteous servant. What do you think happens? They're, it's because they're sick because they feel guilty of the sins they've made against God and in their life and with their family. Maybe they told their family up having an affair, anything. Those are the people who are sick, who, who, who need to understand that God does work people of little faith, that God does do the, what he says he's going to do, and he does it in the manner he's always done. He selects a man. And for the day of the Lord, he described him. He knew how difficult it was going to be in this age of secularism, atheism, you know. Tell me, I'm an atheist. But he taught me up well. And after the five years of learning, the five years of writing, we had over a little over a year to put the, the first book together, Isaiah 53, in the day of the Lord. And then just recently, that was a year and a half or better ago, and then here just recently, he just all of a sudden had me write The Life of God's Righteous Servant, dictated it to me, and it didn't take seven days to put it together, although I'm still tinkering with it, changing things, which makes me feel like I'm part of it, and he does that for me. I always feel like I'm still myself, still make mistakes and errors, this and that, but when I'm dealing with his stuff, <laughs> I don't ever worry about it because I know he's doing it perfectly and perfectly as he wants it. Were the victims of the Holocaust crushed with disease? I don't think so. I've never heard such a thing. Are the six million murdered Jews of the Holocaust all the Jews gathered as one man? No. Did God murder six million Jews? No. Have the Jewish people as one man made the many and multitude righteous? Nope. The six million murdered in the Holocaust here did. The people of Israel are not God's righteous servant. The leper scholar versus Israel in Isaiah 53. Exaltation. The belief that Isaiah 53 describes the Jewish people as the man Israel that is often attributed to Rashi is now the prevalent teaching on the subject. Jews for Judaism is one of the most followed on the internet in its analysis of Isaiah 53, being the people Israel. The following is from Jews for Judaism, Isaiah 53, verse by verse. There's been no change to, to anything. She's directly from their internet site. We say allow you to download. They authorize the use of this material. If you're not authorized, if someone going to say share this or download this, take this, in some manner authorizing you to take it, you are not to take information from people's websites. But having this authority to take it, the only thing I had to worry about is slander and perjury, and that is not something I would do. I'm a lawyer, very familiar with these things. This was in quotes. 52, 13. Behold, my servant shall succeed. He will be exalted and become high and exceedingly lofty. The success an exaltation of God's servant is an event that the prophet sees as futuristic. This is used for Judaism, and, and that particular uh, verse 12 is different than the one that's used in the Jewish Publication Society's 1985 <coughs> edition of the translation of Hebrew to English of the Hebrew Bible. I'm not sure where, they, where, where it comes from. Continuing on with this writing, the immediate context, chapter 52, verses 7 through 12, 
tells us that this is part of the blessing that Israel will experience at the time of her restoration. This is my commentary on that. In Isaiah 52, verses 13 through 15, a multiple verse quotation, starting at 13, ending at 15, the verses are combined. The Lord begins to describe his righteous servant of chapter 53. Isaiah 52, 13 through 15 should have been verses 1 through 3 of chapter 53. My servant to be exalted and become high and exceedingly lawfully is now the Gentile man God comes with from Adam, a Christian country, and of the Jewish people none are with him. It is not the exiles. It is the Gentile that becomes my righteous servant in Isaiah chapter 53 verse 11 after passing the test of devotion in Isaiah 53, verse 10, when he makes himself an offering for gift in a covenant with God. The immediate context of Isaiah 52, verses 7 through 12 is poetry and an announcement of prophecy fulfilled in the return to Judah of all 13 tribes a remnant of each tribe who had been deported and exiled to Assyria, Babylon at one time or another. My servant exalted was the Assyrian Babylonian exiles and the victory. This is, this is from verses 7 through 12. And the victory inside of all the nations was the second temple. It was not a futuristic prophecy. The return included God's forgiveness of all of the sins and inequities of the Assyrian Babylon exiles. <clears throat> Jeremiah's time to come of the new covenant with sin forgiveness in the day of the Lord is for the Roman dispersal, the diaspora, which means outside of the promised land outside of Israel and is futuristic. The translation of Art Scroll and Shabbat of Isaiah 52 that Rashi comments on does not include the quotations that combine verses 13 through 15. The translation used by Jews for Judaism for its commentary also does not have the quotations. They are the only verse quotations of Isaiah 52 and a demarcation of the verses of the fulfillment of prophecy by the return of the remnant of the 13 tribes from exile. They are the beginning, verses 13 through 15, of the description of God's righteous servant of Isaiah 53 and have nothing to do with the exile. Prophecy fulfilled. That's what chapter 52 is, and it ends in verse 12. God's servant it has nothing to do with the exiles, God's servant. So he always calls him, my servant, my servant. And after chapter 53, he doesn't start calling him my righteous servant. That hasn't changed. After Isaiah 53, it's the only time he ever uses the term. God's righteous servant is a Gentile in the beginning. The translation of the Jewish Publication Society has the quotations. This is their rendition. Indeed, my servant shall prosper, be exalted, and raised to great heights. Verse 14, just as the many were appalled at him, so marred was his appearance, unlike that of man, his form beyond human semblance. Verse 15, just so he shall startle many nations, kings shall be silenced because of him, for they shall see what has not been told them, shall behold what they never have heard. 
My servant is now the Gentile and not the exiles who becomes my righteous servant in Isaiah 53, 11, after passing the test of the devotion in Isaiah 53, 10, when he makes himself an offering for guilt in a covenant with God. Isaiah 53 then begins with a new multiple verse quotation that is missing the quotes from the translation of Art Scroll, Shabbat, and Jews for Judaism. But again, it's they are included in the translation of the Jewish Publication Society. And what's interesting about their rendition is they started from scratch a complete new translation begun in 1955. Involved were Orthodox rabbi, a Orthodox rabbi, conservative, and reform, along with uh, specialists in linguistics, professors, scholars from universities. It's been, it would look uh, 55, and it's, it's uh, went to print in 85. So some 30 years of working on this language, and and they 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 use the oldest Hebrew Bible that we have around 1100, I think it is. It's called the Leningrad Codex. And they just, they just took it out, start on the first page. Now all these other renditions are generally, are generally a uh, translation that began with the Leningrad Codex, but it went through several different translators, making different changes. And of course, when this was done, Hebrew had been adopted by the state of Israel, uh, I would suppose in 1948 when Israel was created <clears throat> after the Holocaust. So they, they had a good background, you know. Uh, here, here's how they read. Who can believe what we have heard? Upon whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he has grown by his favor, like a tree kind, like a tree trunk out of arid ground. He had no form or beauty that we should look at him, no charm that we should find him pleasing. He was despised, shunned by men, a man of suffering, familiar with disease. As one who hid his face from us, he was despised. We held him of no account. Yet it was our sickness that he was bearing, our suffering that he endured. We accounted him plagued, smitten, and afflicted by God. Verse 5, But he was wounded because of our sins, crushed because of our iniquities. He bore the chastisement that made us whole, and by his bruises we were healed. Verse 6, We all went astray like sheep, each going his own way, and the Lord visited upon him the guilt of all of us. Verse 10, God chose to crush him with disease that if he would offer himself for guilt, he might receive long life and see his children. For a purpose of God that might prosper. And here they are saying the Lord visited upon him the guilt of all of us. In verse 10, God crushes him on cancer basically to make him offer himself for guilt. And he's exposed to death in verse 11 or 12. No, it's in verse 12. He's exposed to death. So this is a cancer. Uh, the Christian rendition says he's bought some grief. By illness, well, you know, if you're brought to grief and you're exposed to death, it's going to be something like cancer. The speaker is no longer God in verses 1, one through 6. <clears throat> it's no longer God from the Isaiah 52 multiple verse quote, but it's the witnesses of God's righteous servant of the Isaiah 53 multiple quote verse that follows. The witnesses who are Jews identify themselves as ones of the many made righteous by God's righteous servants, saying, 
It was our sickness that he was bearing, our suffering he endured. He was wounded because of our sins, crushed because of our inequities. That's verse 5. He bore the chastisement that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. That's also verse 5. And the Lord visited upon him the guilt of us all. That's verse 6, and see offering for guilt in uh, verse 10. That's just bringing out all these words of, of being punished. The quotes beginning at verse 1 and ending at, after verse 6 identify the speaker of verses 1 and 2 and 3 as also being witnesses made righteous by the righteous servant from the suffering he endured that they speak of. God's teaching is that no man bears the suffering of others. It is not even possible to bear the sins, wounds, chastisement, bruising, sickness, and suffering of others. No one or others can be healed or atoned for because another man or men suffer or are beaten or murdered or sacrificed. So what are these verses by the witnesses about? The sickness of the witnesses is not being righteous. That's what the whole story, it's not a song, it's what the story of Isaiah 53 is. You'll see the Jews for Judaism says these are kings of the nations of the Gentiles. You can think of them, since they're supposedly the leaders, that's the Gentiles he's talking about are the witnesses. This is about a man who God specifically crushes with disease, brings him down low to make him offer himself for the guilt, which is an emotion of the Jewish people that they feel for violating his laws, commandments, and rules. That's the sickness. It makes you sick to your stomach when you realize you're not doing well in God's ways. All the problems you have in your family, with your children, with your boss, everything, if you're sinful, if you're not following the commandments God gave you to live your life as, in the best way possible in this harsh world, and he knows that, those commandments are for us. They're not, it, it, it's just his way of saying, I understand the world's harsh, I have a purpose for it. It's perfect. It's exactly what I want. So, it's, it's God's righteous servant. It's the servant, the Gentile, who suffers by this chastisement, punishment, bruising, crushing, maltreatment, laid on him by the words and power of God. It's not the world that does this. It's not man. It wasn't the Romans. For Jews, for Judaism, it's, 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 it's not the, uh, the way the Gentiles treated you and what you were put through with all the pogroms and the Holocaust. Etc. Etc. <laughs> a purpose and, and uh, by God's power to make him suitable for his purpose that might prosper. Now, this purpose that includes his righteous servant making the many righteous, well, that's the task of the righteous servant. That's not what God's purpose is, to make everybody righteous. No. He's trying to draw people to his prophet, to know who he is by his teachings. That God is with him as he was with Moses. Because as people come to believe who the Moshiach is, who is the man described in Isaiah 53 from chapter 11, verses 1 and 2, that the Spirit of God of life shall come, according to the sages and rabbis and the Talmud, until, of course, Rashi, much later than the Talmud. And today it's uh, Outreach Judaism and Jewish for Judaism that, that I see prevalent. I don't know that all rabbis aren't like Mamanese, Rambam, who said, uh, Rashi's wrong. He's just right wrong. It's too inconsistent. It doesn't fit. 
And Rossi, as I point out in another video, and I believe it gets pointed out in this video, uh, is apparently known for inconsistency. I, I really can't comment on that. Other than I, I have one inconsistency that I'm, I'm talking about. But we find out what that purpose is in Malachi 3. That's the last chapter, the last time God speaks to, to a prophet. That's, they say, uh, and God stopped talking to his prophets, the Bible closes. And that's Malachi 3, and that's the day of his prophetic announcement of the day of the Lord. Now, the day of the Lord it, it shows up in about seven different other uh, books. And uh, it's, it's generally thought of, and the Essenes of the Dead Sea Scrolls also thought this, and they were big followers of Isaiah, that the day of the Lord was a time when it would be a removal of evil and sinfulness in the world. And everybody would get along. The Essenes, who again wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls, they, they believed it was, it was right upon them. And their, their founder, his very name, is the teacher of righteousness. That's Isaiah 53. That's what they say about Jesus. He's the teacher of righteousness. Makes the many righteous by his knowledge, not by his death. That's not what 53 says. But in Malachi 3, God again addresses the day of the Lord. They're, they're all kind of different. There's some... Uh, renditions or some chapters that that the day of the Lord is uh, only as to Christianity, a dominant son, or it's against the nations, or it's against the nations, all Gentiles and Israel. Uh, it just differs, but Malachi 3 gives us a complete new outlook, and it's God's final words on the subject. Again, the writings in antiquity were well, oftentimes just for those people. They, they look like prophecy, but they can't happen in the real world. If it can't happen in the real world, it's not prophecy. God has another purpose. It can be anything from, from uplifting those people in a harsh time who couldn't read a society of ignorance, people basing their, their, their entire uh, life and relationship with other people just on emotion, you know how bad that can be if you act just on emotion without thinking. So, and for religious purposes, just creating religion and even knowing what the Gentiles were going to do with Christianity, God knows all things from beginning to end, causing some controversy, making it interesting for God. And, and of course, it is prophecy, but it's prophecy that can happen in the real world. And that's what the day of the Lord is about. In the day of the Lord, and we know it's here, and I'll get to that in a moment, we know it's here. It's very simple. Uh, I've heard Jews to Judaism and Michael Skobach say, it's when, it, it, it's when we all stop sinning. God will come back. Or I guess he means as many as we can get that are possible. That's, that's not, that's not in the, the scripture. There's nothing in the scripture that says, when, the, when all of the Jewish people together as the man Israel, and they're supposed to be all together. That, that whole concept came at when they all gathered at Horb and God made the covenant with them. That was 100% of the Jewish people. And they had to agree to a man to accept the teachings God gives Moses and then to them. 100% and you do exactly what he says. And, of course, there's a lot of vagueness in a lot of these commandments. And the, the oral tradition started, like it says, you know, you will celebrate Shabbat. Well, how? You know, those kind of things. And the oral tradition occurred. And then finally, uh, it was decided, we, we got to write all these down. There's everybody out there, all rabbis, anybody that knows stories, write them down. And that's what created the Talmud. God knew. That's exactly what would happen by leaving his commandments and laws and rules and teachings so vague in, in many places. And he knew that they were going to associate the Dom with the Saw 
And the Saul is the brother of Jacob, who God renamed Israel. Eternal antagonists, almost enemies. And that's how this whole thing developed, that Adam was considered Rome, then Christian Rome. Rome fell, and today it's Christianity, a reference to Adam Saul. So we find that with the purposes of Malachi. First verse, God says, I'm sending my messenger to clear the way before me. Meaning he already knows there's not going to be a temple. That one's going to have to be built. He already knows. Because he comes with a covenant of friendship that says, I'm going to place my sanctuary amongst you. He knows it's not there. He knew the, of the Roman dispersal. He knew Rome was going to destroy it. Isaiah writes, Sin forgiveness for the exiles of the northern kingdom, the southern kingdom that returned, all 13 tribes. And Jeremiah writes for the return of the dispersal of Rome. The diaspora and sin forgiveness is a part of it. The purpose of God is to return to his temple. He says, I'm sending him to clear my message, to clear the way before me, and I shall return to my temple suddenly. But when it's really good. But he has to come before that because he's got to get a man ready. He's got to have a, a Moses. He's got to have a representative. He's got a man who speaks his words, writes his words, and that he can speak through. They said Moses was his veritable mouthpiece on earth. And that man is described in Isaiah 53. That's what the description is for. Even the sages knew you had to have a description. They see chapter 11, a descendant of David is going to come. And they've only got one description. And they say, well, that sure doesn't look like King David. This man is suffering familiar with disease that is shown in the spine. A county of plague and afflicted by God. That doesn't sound like him, but that's got to be him. And that's exactly what they had written. And that's what's in the talent. And that, of course, is what Rossi disagreed with. He said, no, I don't know that he's raising behind it or anything. I, I, you know, I, I haven't studied Rossi that much. I know he's a great scholar, dearly beloved, and, uh, and thought of, and thought of very highly. Uh, I've read everything he has on his commentary on 53 and several other chapters, just to, well, like Malachi. But see, then I see that you can't, you can't just go with everything somebody says in antiquity, no matter how smart they are, because they only had so much knowledge. You know, we're of the age of enlightenment, reason, knowledge, medicine, science, information, and now the internet. That, not so, not so in antiquity. For instance, verse 1 concludes with, The angel of the covenant that you desire is already on the way. And this, that always perplexed me. But I finally, when God was having me type Isaiah 53 in the day of the Lord, I had two books that he dictated to me, unpublished. Uh, for some reason, Jewish publishers are shying away from it. Matter of fact, everybody's been shying away from it. But that's where God wrote in, shunned and despised. A kind of play is like, you know. Uh, we pray for Moshiach, but when he shows up, they shun him and despise him. And yes, they do. Yes, they do. That, that, part's, that part's taken care of. A lot of it's taken care of. My, well, we'll get to that. So that's his purpose. Let's go to Jeremiah. See your time is coming. He says it three times. One, see your time is coming, and then there's several verses that follow, all the way to 31. See your time is coming again. And then it, uh, it, it skips some verses, and then the last verse is see your time is coming. Okay, here's, what they, here's basically what it says. See your time is coming, the Jewish people will return. Why? Because the land blooms again. From desolation and ruins. You know, see, see uh, uh, chapter 61. Desolation and ruin. Well, 
Mark Twain went there in the late 1800s and said it's nothing but desolation. Nothing is standing. Well, after 1948, if you go look at Israel today, it blooms again. That's how I sum up that whole paragraph. There's a lot of different, you know, great scripture in it. Great verses. <clears throat> now, the last verse, it says, See, the time is coming. Jerusalem shall be rebuilt. From here to there and there and here. Biblical markers. And uh, there's no question, it's, no, it, it's almost impossible to identify them. But you can get enough to know that Jerusalem today is far, far larger and greater than Jerusalem of antiquity. It's a great metropolitan area in that. So there it is. See, time is coming. Land blooms again. See, time is coming. The ruined cities are restored and Jerusalem is rebuilt. And that's simply the Jews have returned. God says, well, when you all return, I'll come back. That's all it is. He doesn't say everybody's got to be sinless. He doesn't say everybody's got to perform a certain amount of mitzvahs or anything else. He says, I know, I, I believe me, I know you all. You, you, I know you like the back of my hand. I know there's always going to be sinners about, uh, among you. I know he's telling us in Malachi that many of you will never heed me. You know, and that's with the covenant of sin forgiveness at hand. And he's saying, I don't know. But you, but you know, when I gave the, when, when I made the announcement that I was going to forgive your sins and that that would cause horror written on your heart and everyone would heed me, that's what you would expect. But we know better. The reality is, no. And that's why he makes a scroll of remembrance for this day, this day of the Lord. It's to put in there those who he revere and esteem his name. The word he's not in Malachi, but esteeming his and revering his name includes he. <clears throat> How is Torah written on your heart? A metaphor? Okay, now moving into the... <clears throat> Verses of chapter 53 of Jews for Judaism that I want to address. They are verses 4, 5, and 10. This is the commentary for Jews for Judaism in quotes. It's called Jews for Judaism, Isaiah 53, verse by verse. Verse 4. But in truth, it was our ills that he bore and our pains that he carried. But we had regarded him diseased, stricken by God, and afflicted. The kings now, re <clears throat> now realize that their spiritual assessment of the servant was completely backward. During the time of the servant's lowliness, those who knew him believed that his constant affliction proves that he is spiritually deformed. Otherwise, why would this nation be singled out for God's wrath over any other? But now, <clears throat> this is all Jews for Judaism. But now, with the servant's exaltation, they realized that the servant was not more wicked than them, but more righteous. So the Gentile nations in the, I guess, end times, the time of the Messianic era when David comes, uh, this, this time of uh, great change in the world, their assessment of the servant is reversed because they come to a true understanding of God's plans. So two billion Christians, two billion Muslims are going to say, the Christians are going to say, well, there's no Jesus. Who are we thinking? The Jews have been right all along. And all the Muslims are doing the same thing regarding Allah. Allah means God, but it's a totally different God from the God of Israel. With the restoration of Israel and God's glory coming to dwell in the Jerusalem temple, the nations of the world will experience true sanctity and a real connection to God. Personally, I believe, I believe the nations aren't going to be happy at all with the Jewish people saying, our Moshiach is here and we're building a temple because God is with him. I don't think they're going to... I don't think they're going to be real happy with the Jews. That may cause the end gathering that's always talked about and send plenty back to Jerusalem as opposed to peace and harmony among us, all nations. That is part of the exaltation, the messianic era. They will realize, this is the Gentiles still, 
or it's the Kings, and as I said, they're Gentiles and they're the leaders. So I, when I read Kings, I see Gentiles. And of course, as I have pointed out, that's not the witnesses. That's not that's not who's talking in, in verse four. That's not who's talking. It's the people who have made righteous. They're sick. And what's what's the story of fifty three about? It's about a man who becomes a righteous servant of God. And these people are righteous. So what's their problem? They're sick because they're not righteous. What does God do? Well, we're going to find out because the key to all that is Ezekiel. It's in there. He went through this. What, 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 what happens in 53, this story, he goes through this wounding, this chastisement, punishment. Okay, it's not wounding. That's the only one that's left out. Bruising and crushing. And God tells us why he's doing it to him. It's to, it, it's to make him suitable for God's purpose. Ezekiel has a furious spirit. I'll get to all this. Or I've gotten to another video. So I don't know. God will take care of that. I, I don't have to worry about it. It'll all come out as it's supposed to. They will realize that many of their activities were actively preventing God's presence from being manifest in this world, even though they had considered, considered many of these activities to be righteous and godly. So it's the Gentiles preventing God's from coming. Really? Is anybody think they can keep God from coming? He made it clear in Jeremiah. God, when, when y'all return, when you when you fix my land back up, when you build me my house, I'll be there. And I'll come up to come in and finish you. And I'm going to forgive all your sins. What is this everybody needs to be sinless? If everybody is practicing Judaism, going to Yom Kippur, and they're not sinning with God, why do they have to be sinless? The covenant, the new covenant says, I forgive you. That's what the covenant is. It's in addition to the, the first covenant with the Israelites. And there's an amendment to that in Malachi 3. The addition of sin forgiveness and the, addition, and the inclusion of an amendment with the confirmation, affirmation by God of you shall be my people and I shall be your God. Well, I mean, as long as you're mindful of the laws I gave Moses that order. That's, that's, that's the first covenant. It's only new because it's being changed up a little bit. That's it. It's not new. God has always been the God of the Jewish people. It never ended and he's starting it over with the new covenant. That's not what it is. But anyway, he comes back with sin forgiveness. That's not an issue. You return, I'll come back. I'll bring some covenant friendship and I'm going to uh, what, what, what ends up happening is all the remaining prophecies of the Hebrew model are fulfilled. And they're fulfilled with one man, God's righteous servant. Because he has the abilities and capabilities of those who are coming, those who have been prophesied to come, that don't have a description. you got four men coming and only one description, the description of the righteous servant. Elijah's coming. He sends him in Malachi 3. That's Elijah. He, he shows up in verse 23. But he's the messenger. He's the man who has to recounsel son to the father, father to the son. Today, there's family members one to the other. And how does he do it? Well, the verse before that is, be mindful of the teachings I gave Moses <clears throat> of all my laws and rules for Israel. Is that it? So, so Elijah's purpose is the same as the righteous servant. Make them righteous. Bring them back to Judaism. Well, that's what the righteous servant has to do. That's how he's going to make them righteous. And he's going to convince them because, one, they're sin free. It says make them any righteous. Well, they're sin free, but they have to know. It has to be announced. How do you announce the covenant? Well, how did you get the first covenant, Jewish people? Moses. God talked to a man, and he gave it to you. And as one man in Israel, you accepted it. The Gentiles have not prevented God from doing anything. Neither have the Jews. They do what he wants, when he wants. In order for God's presence to be revealed in this world, there needs to be a bit, this is Jewish for Judaism still, there needs to be obedience and humility toward God. This obedience does not have to be perfect because God doesn't 
demand from his creations that which they cannot deliver, but it needs to be accepting of God's sovereignty to the degree that humans are capable. Since all of mankind benefits from God's presence being manifested in this world, it would be appropriate that all of mankind participate in the work of preparing a resting place for God's presence. The, <clears throat> the way that this sanctuary for God would be prepared would necessitate the mankind purify its collective heart. Well, wouldn't that be interesting? Does Moshiach have to do that? How does he get mankind to purify its collective heart? <laughs> In order to build this dwelling place for God, mankind would need to strive to achieve humility toward God and to accept God's sovereignty for the entirety of humanity from the Chinese to the Russians to the Australians, every single human being, although not perfectly, has to strive to achieve humility toward God. Good luck, Moshe. That's what I would tell you. And I'm him. So, yeah. I'm a man of Isaiah 53, and this is the 16th video by now. And this is the first time you've watched it, you need to go back and listen to the others. <clears throat> and the witnesses are, the witnesses are the Jewish people. They're the witnesses who need to be made righteous. That's why they're sick. That's why they're in verses 1 through 6 in quotes. That's what this story is about. Now, what are all these words for? What's all this punishment everything else? Well, we're going to find that in Ezekiel. It makes it real quick. So, purifying the hearts of the world. Okay. To purify the collective heart of his servant Israel, and his servant will then, oh. Okay, this task is placed on the Jewish people. Instead of purifying the collective heart of all mankind, God chose to purify the collective heart of his servant Israel, and his servant will then shine the truth toward the rest of mankind. Good luck with that. Okay, I have had that a little bit off, but these are his words. The nations will walk by that light and partake of the goodness of God. Isaiah chapter 60, verse 3. And the way that God chose to purify the heart of his servant is through suffering. Isaiah 48, verse 10. With the exaltation of the servant, the nations will realize that it was through the servant that God was accomplishing his purpose in the world for the benefit of all mankind. The suffering that the servant bore should have been borne by all mankind. And it's, it's, well, it's as though the rest of mankind never suffered. Okay, the Jewish people have been more, through more and more heinous, cruel acts of violence and murder and, and being shunned and despised and, and thought of and accounted as uh, afflicted by God. But, but you're not alone in this world of harshness, Mr. Michael Stoback. Jews for Jews. You're not alone in this. There have been many...